All right, everybody. Happy Saturday. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. Also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show and Instagram show and now TikTok show <laughs> uh, where I use almost three decades of experience as a craftsperson and an entrepreneur, paint business owner to answer any questions. Um, special guest today, Estimator Andy, friend, confidant, <laughs> fellow coworker, and we make up the sales team, the estimating team, the first point of contact in this entire company. When somebody uh, asks us for something, a painting estimate, it's either me or Andy that goes out there, and more and more, it's Andy, probably 90% <laughs> yes. of the estimates now. So uh, we're gonna go deep into Andy's origin story. We're gonna talk about how he got here, maybe some philosophy about how we estimate, and of course, if you guys have any questions too, We'll take any of those. So the biggest question I always get, obviously, through the painter internets, because I'm a loudmouth, is what do you charge for X? What do you do this? So <laughs> yeah, that's what we dwell in every day. And yeah. not and and you know, like when somebody says, Hey Andy, what do you charge for X? It's almost one of those like, okay, there's either the one sentence answer or the four hour conversation, right? <laughs> like always, yeah. That's that's the thing is <laughs> trying to find that in between ground sometimes is tough. It's like which, which end do you want to go on? Which, yeah. which scale? It's like, I okay, I have a Santa's list yeah. of 100 variables that we need to check off first, and then we'll say that's yeah. what, you know. So anyway, we'll get, we'll get deep into that stuff. Uh, list your questions down below. I do have to say that June 6th, June 7th, which is basically a week from now, I will be embarking on my Northeast tour. This is the second Northeast tour I've done. Um, we did one about two years ago, three years ago. Um, we were planning another one, got shut down for COVID, and we are back now. So I will actually be doing a whole bunch of stuff. There's a link in this show uh, on Facebook if you guys want to attend any of my master's classes. I will be first going to Vermont. I'll be flying out Sunday, uh, either the 6th or the 7th, I can't remember. Uh, staying in Vermont, and I'm doing a special project with one of my best friends in the industry, Noel Cantor. Uh, he has the uh, podcast Advice from a Young Tradesman, one of my favorite shows on the internet. We're actually going to be backpacking stain into a wilderness cabin, staining it. I know, idiots, right? <laughs> <That sounds awesome. laughs> I know. And, and then backpacking out. And then the next day, we'll actually be holding a, a series of master's classes in Burlington, Vermont, uh, there. And Noah is kind of the host of uh, and wrangling. He is basically exhausting himself on the ground, getting ready for this sort of thing. So I cannot wait to be there with him and do this stuff. The conversations always go like this. Noah emails me or we're on the phone. He's like, hey, Nick, I got this special. Okay. <laughs> All right. What are you doing, Noah? I'll fly out a day early. We'll backpack into the woods and we'll, we'll probably take a pretty backpack, put a gallon of stain in it and walk into the woods. So yes, nerd stuff. Um, we will then be going uh, to Boston, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, uh, successive dates. Uh, we'll start on a, on a Monday. We will end on a Friday. And there's going to be master's classes, two master's classes per day in each of those locations. If you guys want to go there, there's a link here. All you got to do is sign up. And uh, what the... Um, what the PCA did was pretty cool. They actually have QR codes in the uh, in the advertising for it. Just hold it up to your phone, click the link, click the prop that shows up, and you can attend one of these things. And I would love to see you guys. There's already been a flurry of activity. I've been answering DMs and emails uh, for the last two weeks about it. So I would really love to see you guys there. And uh, a whole bunch of awesome hosts. We're going to be uh, uh, traveling to, uh, well, it's it's Noah, obviously. Then it's going to be uh, Tom Lapatoski, uh, who's a fellow painting contractor we've known for a bunch of years. Um, Nigel Costello with Catchlight Painting, also the executive director of the PCA. He's hosting us. Uh, and then uh, Dave Scaturo, uh, one of the one of my earliest sort of people that I looked up to in the entire industry. One of the first people to ever introduce himself. Monster commercial and industrial painting company. Uh, Long-standing family business. I look up to this guy. When I grow up, I want to be like Dave Scaturo. He, we're having uh, master's classes at his shop. So that is going to be great. If you have never met Dave or his brothers or Bezzy, Bezzy, his estimator, Bezzy is the Andy of Alpine painting. And Bezzy is one of the coolest dudes you'll ever meet in the industry. One of my friends. So, uh, look forward to that. That's awesome. Sign up for that. Uh, and also the PCA, uh, again, people like Andy, people like me, the PCA dog whistles to a certain segment of the trades, uh, people who are aggressive and progressive and want to do things better. So, what you'll find out in the unwashed painter world of the internet is what do you charge for X and people telling you vulgar things in return. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what you'll find in the PCA is dudes like Andy and I sitting down and say, we're gonna schedule half a day and we're gonna talk about your life. <laughs> we're gonna talk about your business, your goals, and then eventually we'll teach you how to come up with price, teaching somebody how to fish instead of handing them a fish sort of thing. 
And that's the thoughtfulness that you're going to find in the PCA. So, all right, no further ado, we're going to get to this guy, one of my favorite people, <laughs> Estimator Andy. So uh, Andrew Hall, how, so you were, so you've, you've been here at Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration eight months, nine months? Yeah, October. October. Yeah. yeah. So really, not that, it feels like we've been together no. for a lifetime, <laughs> no, exactly. but we've been. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how, so you, you came here with previous painting experience, yeah. which as people know, that was a couple check marks against you. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. So as I'm or, learning now. Origin story. How did you get started in painting? Well, I, uh, my dad painted, he was a social worker for the school systems yep. um, down in um, Southern Minnesota, mm -hmm. Southland School District, which is Grand Meadow. Right in the border of Iowa, ten miles from a couple Iowa. hours from where we are yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, about hour hour twenty. Um, so he was he was doing the social work thing. I worked for the county originally, and then moved into the into the school system. So he was off during summers. So of course, my mom had a business as well at home, which she had ran a daycare for about thirty some years now, Jeez. and uh, in the house, and just math, very professional. Like you get home from that from work or from school, and you would never know if there's a daycare at this house. So in in saying that, my mom also said she's like. Mike, you're not you're not gonna be home all summer long while I'm working, like, thinking around here. So find something to do. So he started wow. painting with another teacher, as a lot of teachers do. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> which I didn't realize was such a wide like, oh, dude, range there of is, people that are. I that. I wish there was some way to measure the painter slash student yeah. three month summer economy like yeah. that. It is massive. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you get this you know college pro type people that are you know in between, and that's where he started originally too. He goes, oh, of, really? I didn't know that. Not college pro, but it was like the same like one of the one of those things. Yeah. Way back, yeah. probably the, not way back. I shouldn't say that. He's listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, back in you know when he was in college, he would paint it with a bunch of his friends, and he's yeah. like, oh, this isn't that bad. I don't yeah. you know. I don't hate this. Um, but then picked it up in the in the summers with a, another a teacher and it took off they just they kind of neither really had a lot of professional experience i yeah. would say in painting so a lot of the things he learned was was self-taught or just reading through the many books like you guys have here yeah yeah this yeah old time stuff my my grandpa on my mom's side was a plasterer so, oh yeah. that's so awesome he, so he did a lot of that stuff so it was like um it kind of felt hand in hand and just my dad's just one of those guys where it's like I'm gonna figure out how to do these things. I'm gonna do it as well as I can, and then just yeah. perfect it on as it goes. And so he did that for twenty some years. I think I probably helped scrape you know houses with him, our house, a lot. I remember yeah. using the old the torch heat gun uh, set up, and that smell still is like burned into my brain of burning lead paint, probably. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which maybe ex explains a lot. It'll, 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 you'll be revisiting that in about <laughs> yeah, thirty like years from now. Yeah, <laughs> both of us probably. Yeah. So he's. <laughs> You know, it's scraping paint out there. And I think there's a picture still of me sitting with my Walkman headphones on and he's taking a picture of me next to the house of the garage scraping. It's like, you can tell I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> it sounds like we had a very similar yeah. sort of upbringing. Yeah. I didn't have a torch because that was a piece of technology and my old man frowned against technology. It's, but yeah, it's, it's, it was more just, you got, a, you got a screwdriver. <laughs> Sharp it away. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but that. when I hear you talk about your old man, mm -hmm. I, my impression is thoughtful. Oh yeah, yeah. He was. He didn't work in the trades per se. I mean, he. Funny thing, he went to. Uh, I'd say the closest he had to trades was you know working college a little bit. Then when he got out of college, he moved up to Manitowoc, Minnesota, or oh no, Wisconsin. Yeah. And uh, he had a, like his dream job: corner office, working for the county as a social worker. Oh and then God. within a month or two, they went on strike. <laughs> so the whole county did. So he, of course, was painting houses. <laughs> no, he, he was unloading peat from. A, oh jeez. <laughs> Peat moss from set off of trains. So like, you might have to so they were there and they had their not, not 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 what you would typically no. think of no, as right somebody who's a social. Like, yeah, great. I'm gonna I got this great job I'm and a now or something. Yeah. yeah. So then he did that and they finally the, the union got broke essentially. And so Jeez. my mom and him were like, well, this is not gonna work here. So they moved back to Austin oh my God. and this whole thing started. But yeah, so he really I mean he didn't have like like you know, I I, I was went to work for a pipe fitting union for right out of high school. That's one of my favorite stories that you tell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like he's coming to, you know, a lunchtime. We were working at Mayo Clinic. I mean, this is. So uh, I should give some perspective. Yeah, so the old man would would dabble in passion, say dabble, because it sounds like he was thoughtful, but yeah. lots of lots of summers painting. Yeah. He would recruit his natural. Yeah. The, the easiest labor force to <laughs> yeah. recruit is. I don't know if my brother ever got into it. That's the thing. <laughs> Sam, I don't know if he ever had. He, my older brother ever got sucked into brothers that. put their foot down. Yeah, right probably. Said, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but, so, could, so yeah. you. So years of sort of like the summer stuff yeah. the this and that 
and then eventually you graduate high school and then so set the scene yeah. there. Yeah, so we, uh, I got out of high school. I went to school to be like, oh, originally got out of high school and I was like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Yeah. I went up to WyoTech. I did that for a while because I wanted to be an auto tech. Kind of automotive repair. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother's been a mechanic forever, so and I, I had that as a hobby. I loved mm -hmm. cars, a little tinkering with stuff, even though my brother told me a million times, like, keep it as a hobby. Don't, don't turn it into a job. Nothing against it, and I, I loved it, but then I went from I really enjoyed working on the cars, but then I got moved up to the service manager job. And it was just like this constant negative reinforcement. So finally, after a few years of working for a small repair shop, I was like, this is just not, it's killing, not killing me, but it was just like, this isn't really what I want to do either. Cause that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So like in, so the, a, a similarity between a service manager, what you did <laughs> and like what we do is at least people call us and they want to do some aesthetic exactly. improvement. Not with them they're like this is wrong i don't want to spend this money this isn't fun it's inconvenient yeah, right i mean exactly. there, there's no like no it's very rarely if someone comes <laughs> and be like i would love for you to put a brand new alternator in my car like, I would, so really <laughs> I, I would love to spend a whole bunch of money on things that i don't understand no, yeah, that I will just, basically bring me back to zero yep, right <laughs> my job to my house and my job to my house so either way my my dad at the time had retired from the school system yeah. and picked up full you know full-time painting at, i think he was 55 Maybe it was a little older than that, but um, either way, so he, he he's like, hey, you know, you're jobless yeah. <laughs> now, come back and start painting with me. And I remember going, and that, I never really worked on any interior jobs up to that point. So I remember getting there and my dad handed me the first day it came in, I went out and bought like the cheapest little work bag I could find oh, with yeah. like basic tools in it through some screwdrivers, uh, scrapers, uh, you know. He, he's like, here's a couple brushes, uh, old brushes that he handed me down, <laughs> you know, oh, so yeah, real yeah. nice, you know, like this. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. a beaker from the yeah. um, Muppet's hair. <laughs> and then learn, then cutting this trim, you know, we flat taped everything. We didn't tape it like you guys do work. And we had about an eighth inch gap just to catch bombs with, oh, from sure. rollers. And handed me a, a little scraper, a, a one inch putty knife with a wood handle made in the United States. And I still have it to this day. Oh, nice. And a, a wet rag. And he goes, cut it, cut these walls in. I'll come behind you and roll. Um, so I start cutting and I remember the first day I'm going, I'm done. I'm not doing this. I can't freehand cut this. It's going to take me forever. Wow. And he just, you'd stop. He goes, if you get on the trim, take that wet rag, wrap it around the, the thing and just run it along the edge and wipe that paint off, which probably is the most professional thing in the world, but we never, once again, you, you know, you get the trim clean enough and it wasn't like you're slapping on, but so slowly after about six months, I'd probably say I, I had picked up the cutting and, you know, freehand cutting. And he was allowing me to roll. And I remember the first time I rolled the wall, he was like train tracks across the wall. Oh, and, you know? yeah. And it's, yeah. it's like, oh my God, this doesn't look right. Of course, I call my dad and he's like, yep, we're going to be repainting this wall. And I was like, what? It's like, there's not there's something we can do other than repaint. He's like, no, sand down if there's any ridges. Wow. And we're going to, you know, fresh paint on it again. Yeah. So it looks good. And that was the thing that we're, you know, really taught me he, he would pull off vent covers clean take them home scrub them for the customers oh yeah put them back up and there wouldn't be a single charge which is great i'm not against that but then we you know, we move furniture which we do here so yeah i actually yep. talked him out of that for a long time uh, yeah, <laughs> i was yeah, like yeah. this seems really silly that we're moving all this furniture for people and like especially young people younger than me that we're doing work for yep and he's like it's just part of the job it's a it's a bonus it's yeah. something that doesn't take us a long time yeah. And then I just fought against it for a long time and to the point where we at, you're like, if you can move stuff, you can. If not, we'll move for you. Um, and then coming here and seeing that, I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that to him. <laughs> maybe well, we should have but... kept moving furniture. But it was little things like that. But so either way, I started, got into it. And about a year into it, I'm like, this is actually really enjoyable. You know, just come in, be able to see a product, your know, product where it's like these people call us to come in and beautify their home. And like, yeah. just, they didn't, completely different from the auto field. Like I said, I don't want to do this stuff, but I'm here yeah. to do it. And so I just have that that pushback all the time where painters come in, they're like, oh God, here you are. Do you want a cup of coffee this morning? What can we get for you? Like just a whole different world. And we still had some customers where it's like, I just want you to paint. I don't, I'm not going to be friendly there, with you. There's all, always that, yeah, right? Exactly. Okay. You're not going to get away from it. So that was the thing. And like he, I think the biggest thing I took away from him, first off, learning how to paint from him. Um, we didn't do a lot of spraying. I remember when, <laughs> look at that. That's another story, but sprayer <laughs> things. Um, but just brush and roll and all that stuff and just his customer service and like just treating other yes. humans like even if they're crabby even if they're horrible horrible humans mm -hmm. say to us and any other people other tradesmen that were in the house working he just he would just take it he's like buddha he just said oh, all right well we're gonna keep doing this keep doing what we're doing surprise surprise a yeah. master social worker <laughs> yes. focuses people. on the human yep. side of it yeah, yeah boy funny how that works right? it is and then that's kind of where like he we, we had a good setup where like when i first came in 
And then once I got everything down, when I was rolling, cutting ceilings, doing the whole shoot match, we'd, you know, each take up, we came into a house, we were doing three bedrooms, we'd both go in, prep two bedrooms, he'd be painting one, I'd be painting another, yeah. and we just keep kind of moving through the house until we met up into the common space and we yeah, tackled yeah, that together. Yeah. And yep. I would be cutting low and then cutting up as high as I can reach from the ground and he'd cut down from the ceiling and then I would roll and kind of just, it was, yep. it worked out. By the end, we had this like system where we didn't have to talk to each other. We'd come yeah. in, the, in the morning, we'd both go up to our spots and it was kind of weird to get done at like lunchtime and be like, Feel like we haven't even seen each other like yeah, compared yeah. to before, but um, how interesting, yeah. And so, we, we learned a lot from just like how he dealt with customers. And at the point, like leading up to that, like the uh, not leading up to it, but after we got our systems down for the technical, you know, painting things, he would always kind of run we call it running interference, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the customer would come in and you know, we have these people where they want to sit and watch you do your stuff or they're right in your way, and he would mm -hmm. kind of stop what he's doing so that I could continue just to produce. And he would just be that person going, well, what do you think of this color? I'd have be like, this is, you know, this is the color you pick. This is what you think of it, you know, the sheen and just yeah. kind of go over everything and, and just keep that. If there was anything boiling over as a customer, yeah. They, yeah. he would kind of tamp that back down. And while I still produce, because, you know, he was huge on <laughs> when I first started out, I'd forget things. Like oh, any, sure. any young man would go and it's like, oh, I didn't bring this ladder. Oh, yeah, I didn't bring, yeah, yeah. I brought all the stuff. <laughs> There's one day we didn't have a single surf set in the entire, on either one of the vans. And it's like, how do we, as painters, show up to a house and not have Especially when they sticks. shovel hands. Yeah, exactly. And, and exactly. half the time we're saying, ah, we don't need any more. We got plenty. Exactly. Yep. And it's usually like after you clean out a van and there's that bucket full out there, you know, bag full yeah, of surf yeah. sticks. And it's like, oh, let's sit in the floor in the garage. I know exactly where it's at. It's not here. And he's always like, if you don't have a brush in hand, you're not, you're not making money. Like if you're not painting, we're not, someone's not actively putting paint on walls we're not doing our job. So like when he would get customers that kind of hone in on trying just to- just needed some more interaction. Yeah, he, yeah. We, we had a good system where it was just like automatic. And yeah. that was something that was just so nice to have. And then we kind of switched spots sometimes where it'd be like, oh, they come in and check on me and I would stop so he could keep painting. And yeah, just kind of yeah, yeah. rotate through. But yeah, so that's kind of how I got into it. And uh, you know, it just, it would turn into something that was temporary or I thought it was gonna be temporary. And yeah. here it is, you know, 12, 12 some years later. <laughs> Still so loving it. What, what, but, Fast forward to this year where, uh, end of last year, where for the first time ever in my life, somebody else estimated a project for this company, <laughs> which is a huge leap okay. because, you know, as, as you know, letting go of certain things is this like maturation progression. So yeah. the first thing that I got over with years ago was what if I don't paint every project that we do. And you're like, well, how's that ever going to work? And then it works. Yeah. You know, and what if, what if I don't order all the paint or schedule, how's that ever? And then it works. And then finally, the last thing I let go was some of the estimating. So, but hard. that, that to me is like a line of demarcation in a professionalized company though, which is hypothetically, somebody could go to my website, put in an inquiry, you show up at, up at their house, Justin or Holly sets the job up. Mm -hmm. One of the painters paints it and nobody ever meets me in the process. That's a, that's a leap. And we it passed is. that this last year. Yeah. And it's, I mean, as a business owner before this, yeah. um, down in Austin, like I, I would have a hard time. I'm sure what you run into a lot is like, yeah. and you see it on all the paint forums on you know, paint contractors or Facebook groups. It's like, how do you, I, I can't, I, no one else can do this job better than I can do yeah. it. You and, might be right. And then that's, and yeah, there might be that, but you doesn't mean that you can't teach someone to be good, as good as you, if not better. Yep. Yeah um on something and, and to cut that control or that like yep. that leash off of what you're doing i i guess it's, it's probably really hard to convince people to do that i have to say yeah. well so for you to do it too is like <laughs> i so uh, one of my accountability partners always reminds me a team will always outperform yeah you know and so right now the 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 awesome crafts people and apprentices we have will always outperform me or you or you and me together <laughs> yeah and on a whole, you know what I mean? So there's no way that you and I, master crafts people, are gonna get out in the field and produce and make that many happy clients every week. No. A team will produce, outproduce the whole thing. So mm -hmm. uh, it helps if we have a super performer <laughs> as well <laughs> to help do that so we don't have to get eight people to take yeah. up the, the, the thing, but no. So, and we should say um, how, and, and we'll get to some questions and things later on here. So how did we, we've interacted before we became yeah. Joined at the hip. Yeah. What what was your impression of the interaction? Because I I'm assume I'm assuming most people, and especially being Minnesota painters, we know each other from social media, right? Yeah. So can you hearken back to the days of kind of first contact sort of things? Yeah, I think I, I think I reached out to you first time. Well, first off, it was probably on my my bedroom my pricing for bedrooms. 
Like, what do you charge for X? <laughs> yeah, it was the same, same, same question you probably get a million times. And you gave me perspective on it. And, and it was like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. And I remember, I think I remember telling, because I was like, I'm going to tell 24,000 people, Nick. And you're like, I'm going to tell 7,000. I was like, okay. That's, <laughs> which, that, that, so that is honestly, like that is, there are, you, you and I talk a lot about data points. And a lot of times we get mixed data, right? Yeah. Like uh, some points to this, some points to this. You and I talk all the time about absolute data points. Mm -hmm. Another absolute data point, which I have, is nearly every painting contractor I've ever talked to in the United States believes you can't find good people yeah. and believes uh, and, and legitimately is vastly underpricing their work. Yeah. And, and that that is a universal point. You know, I talked with a, a person about their job costing this morning <laughs> about that stuff. And, and same thing. It's like, listen, you just have no idea what the market will bear out there. And it's not about gouging and raising the prices. It's about, no, there is a baseline. If you don't charge this, there's no way you can afford work comp, insurance, health insurance for your people, retirement, a shop, vans. Like there's a Best Buy knows what to charge so they can offer that stuff. Yep. Painters do not know that. No, you know what I mean? It's tough, man. I, you and I ran the same type of businesses. <laughs> we were fire sailing work. We were doing Sunday mornings. We're cleaning vents at home. Yep. We're moving furniture. We're like, oh, you need your dog walk too? We'll walk your dog. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, I got a lighter. Of course I would clean your chimney while I'm here. You know, yeah. it's so. <laughs> oh yeah. There's many times. Can you change the light bulb while you're up there? Yeah. Why not? Absolutely. You know? And then what, if, even if it was like, oh, we don't have a ladder. So you have extension, like we are those two story rooms. So you'd be like, I don't have, even have a ladder here to do what you're asking me to do. So I'm going to go home and yeah, get it yeah. and I'm going to waste two hours, not waste, but take two hours of yeah. time where I can be painting to change the light bulb. Exactly. And then not, there's nothing to return for, but other than happy customers. But yeah, um, early, early interactions. And yeah, I, I, yeah. I went back through some of our interactions too. It was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually I got to the point where I, I spent about six, well, I think I spent almost a year and a half craft, crafting the estimator position to make sure it's right. You yeah. Because I was very nervous about that position. And then finally I put it out there and <laughs> yeah, I remember sitting, I mean, after talking to you, I think I asked, like said about pricing on that. And there's a time I asked about like, I think siding, like peeling aluminum or oh, steel siding. Yeah, yeah. And, like what, what to do with this stuff. And just the interaction between you, like your answers and stuff. It's like, this guy is like, first off, a answering questions I'm asking him. Cause you don't need to do that. 90% of the people, you should, not 90, but a lot of people you sent out, they'd be like, eh, especially in Minnesota, like I'm an hour oh, and 20 yeah. minutes from you. So there's that whole um, competition thing that could happen, which you did. Secrets. You, yeah, exactly. The like, secrets no. out. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, this is awesome. So then I started digging deeper into your, your you know, information, the Ask the Painter show. And it's like, oh my God, this guy's like, is doing a craft and you're not, you're not in this like weird push it, jam it down your throat kind of thing. You're not the gross, like, just like, oh, I'm a contractor. I'm a, you know, the tr they're, I shouldn't talk all about the trades, but no, but listen, one of the things it, to summarize that whole yeah. thought, I, I've never held up a fanned out thing of hundreds and yeah. said, killing it Friday. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what this is about. No, you exactly. know what I mean? Like, this is about providing really? value to clients, creating a business that's a real asset, providing good jobs to people, and just taking this whole Wild West fan out the hundreds trade and just yeah. make it into like this thing that people can depend on, right? Mm -hmm. Build a, build something, a life around and yeah. uh, something to support your family with. Tide will, tide will rise all the boats. Yep. Yeah. So then I remember when you posted out that estimator, I was sitting at COVID, you know, this is last August, mm. I think I contacted you. I had just got married, um, had a baby in March. Um, World you know, shut down. Yes, everything <laughs> shut down. I was trying to run a business by myself. My dad had pretty much, pretty much fully retired this, well, he's never fully retired, but retired enough <laughs> where he wasn't doing exteriors. He wouldn't take up. Yeah, he yeah. He could yeah. reach it from a six foot step ladder. He's not gonna touch yeah, the job. Yeah, yeah. Still helped me with a lot of stuff, but there was a certain point where it's like, I can't keep tapping him. He's 60, you know, so this was last year. So 68 is yeah. what I think. 68 years old. And like, you need to be retired. Like you need to take time to go fish. I'm not going to keep bugging you. To or come if you out. want to paint, it should be a choice. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. If you want to come help me, fine. But I'm not going to keep asking. Like, and I didn't beg him every He showed up when I needed him. Yeah. Um, but it was getting to the point where it's like, I'm working. If you ask my wife, she might be watching like, I was working long days. I mean, just getting up, leaving and now with the kid and, and my, my daughter, um, it was just, it was, it was too much of like, just, and I enjoy it, but I get home and you're, just, you're not shot or burnt up. It's like, what? Well, I, I need to change something because this is first off and it's not about money, but it's at some point it's like, there's just this outweighing of, 
Well, at Priorities. some point, it's, you know, we always talk about energy units. Yeah. Oh, you and I expend a lot of energy units <laughs> to do this stuff. And they're, at least for, you know, guys like you and I, we could work 16 hours a day, do that for the rest of our lives. But when you involve a family, mm -hmm. that 16 hours cuts into the time you should be doing something yeah. with them. So then all of a sudden, that's a good backstop. That's yeah. a good, like, ballast to check you. Off the ball off. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should do something. Yeah, there's this thing over here that says, no, no, no yeah. farther than <laughs> yeah. this. No, it's just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, or coming home and like, and yeah, I think my biggest thing, it's not burned out, but it was like, you get to a certain point where it's harder to tolerate the bad things that happen in the company. Like all of a sudden I'm getting this horrible certificate leaching on an entire house and I'm painting yeah. by myself that I'd probably undercharged on. Um, and how to handle it. You spend all day and you get home and you're just like, oh, what, so, what can I do differently on this? But that, that feeling goes away if there's a reciprocal reward. Yeah. Most painting companies risk. do not. Yeah. The risk and reward thing. Like, listen, we got 13 vans on the road and <laughs> the, the amount of insurance that I pay is twice the amount that I pay for all my mortgages yeah. all over the place. And if there's not a reciprocal reward, if one thing goes wrong, it all goes away. So yeah, those feelings, like it, it's people call it burnout, but really what it is, is this deep seated, sometimes unconscious, like I'm putting a lot into this <laughs> and I don't feel like I'm getting an equivalent or, or, yeah. you know, if you if you're paying, you know, if you're at a hundred dollar slot machine, it only pays out nickels. That's like, eh, I don't feel like this is a good one for yeah. me, you know. So yeah, sorry, I've, but, yeah, I've, my lever. <laughs> most painting contractors, including myself, have all been there. Where all of a sudden you're like, the money's there, but only because I'm working two days a day, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I would so I hit that point where it's like either I'm going to try to bring in people to replace my dad, which training and now seeing how you guys trained and do these things, it's, it's a little more eye-opening and it's like, oh, you could, I could have done some things differently. I know I could have done a lot. Everybody of can. Yeah. But at that point, I was just like, I think, like, seeing your post, I was sitting in my van at the house with this certain <laughs> leaching going on. I'm like, ah, this, this is, I'm at, a, like, a, there's a, a, a why in the road here and I'm just going to reach out and I remember sending it out, sending an email to you and just probably just dumping normal Andy rambling out to you, like, Here's it was a long like, email, yeah. yeah, and, I was yeah. Just, and I was typing on my phone in the car, and I was like, "Hit the send button." I'm like, "Yeah, we'll see." Start of the year, yeah. like, "What's where's this gonna go?" And you responded with, uh, you know, an email saying like, "Hey, come talk, and let's let's talk about this." And then I remember the day before I was gonna leave, and I was reading through the again in detail the job description. I was like, "Because oh, I, I don't have a you know a degree in cylinder head machine and not a, a bachelor's yeah. or anything <laughs> like that." And then you get twenty time we're like, "Oh." It's, this bachelor, and I, I remember met, emailing be like, sorry, man, but I, I just saw you need a bachelor's and you're like, no, you know, for the right person, we'll see, you know, come talk. So that was, that was the point where it's like, yeah, this, this is something. So I came up here, we had a, I think a job interview slash thing we had talked and I talked to you off for two, two and a half hours. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> so I, right so I never, I never think of those as interviews. That's just more of like culture fit. Yeah. You know, you're just trying to just like suss out, like, <laughs> what do we think about family? What do we think about the mm -hmm. fee? You know, it's that thing. It's like the job description. I mean, legitimately, you know, now that basically anybody can be taught anything, right? Like yeah, I was a mechanic fine. once in the army, yep. you know, <laughs> I, I, I was taught to do stuff like that. I was taught to paint houses. I was taught to do accounting for the right person with the right mindset. Anything can be done. And, and the process of going through that with you and especially with production managers and stuff too, I really realized like, honestly, it's all culture fit. It's yeah. like, it doesn't matter. And everybody who comes here, like painters too, they're always worried about, well, I don't have painting experience. Like, yeah, not what we're looking for. No. Like not interesting to us no. most of the time. And in fact, it could be a check mark against you. Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, for you a long with, time. with a couple like the Jasons and the Bradys and stuff that have yeah. come now, like those are unicorns. Those are guys who came here with knowledge and did that. But that's not always the case. Yeah. So already I had I was I was doing one of the <laughs> like, oh you paint, huh? Uh -huh. Oh, we'll see how this goes, yeah. you know. <laughs> no, that's and that's the case. And it's it's good that we're finding people like Jason and Brady too, like that that do like I feel like there's a tide that's maybe changing in this industry a little bit. Yeah. I can you can lean on a lot of it on you, man. Just training these younger people coming in and having these decent decent humans um, to come work with us. But I think and I think that was really something too because I at the time I was feeling you out too oh, to feel like because it's like I could put more grit into this business yeah. on Austin. Um, That's a super interesting crossroads, yeah. and 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 we kind of just blazed over it. Yeah. But you're talking about basically the changing of the hands of a family business. Mm -hmm marriage, baby, <laughs> global pandemic, and this monstrous fork in the road. Yeah. 
Like that's like yeah, don't, don't, that's not something we can just say two sentences and go no. on. Like that's that's a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. Yeah, and my, my wife and me in twenty twenty when you know Oren was born, March fourteenth, the weekend this all started, the whole COVID thing started. I was sitting in the hospital holding him, Nicole sleeping, and I was just reading the news and I'm like, oh lord, like what is how is this going to affect me? Because like, I got to go in people's houses now. People are going to be in their houses all the time. This, you can't go anywhere without masks. Is this going to be killing half the population? Like, exactly. no one really knew it. Yeah, at that time, like, nobody knew. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, no, I just, I've got a baby boy in the world, plus our daughter. Right, too, here we go. Like, yeah. what's, what's the best thing for the family? And so and I, I pushed through those March and I think, except like, contact you in August. But that year, I just realized, I was like, hey, there's, there's something. I could do something not different, but I was like, you, you, I, you, had, the, you had the instinct that. It was go time. <laughs> I think my, like I said, not the burnout thing, but it was like, I don't know my biggest thing for deciding and coming to talk to you. And I was like, I feel like this would, first off, and I was also missing, my dad was one thing, having him to work with. And you yeah. have that person, but I was in empty houses for a lot of years just by myself. Yeah. With headphones, podcasts, audio books and stuff. And you start to miss out. Like, I'm a social person. I like to talk to people. I yes, you are. I can try to tell. Um, but and I, I used to bartend too on the, in the evenings just because that was like my, like, oh, I got some coworkers, I got yeah. this team, I can kind of bounce, you know, have these, this interaction that I needed. And then after putting, you know, not stop bartending because family time and stuff like yeah. that, um, I was missing that, like, just that team aspect. I mean, you have your paint store, you have your paint reps, and you have yeah, other painters you bump into the Sherwin Williams, but when you pay somebody, that's a. <laughs> yeah. And it's, but the coming here and hearing about how, you know, you and Justin and Holly ran. The leadership team and stuff and, and then just and the painters and, and everything it's like this sounds fun first off fun, fun. and second of all pro very professional and something interesting like yeah you know, and something that's kind of in transit right? yeah so and it's so, not you know one one thing that would never interest you and we we were talked very uh very intently about this because i use this to gauge things it's like so andy how about folding up your business and being the master craftsman of the company and you're like <laughs> I mean, fine, but like, no, no, yeah. that's not, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be deserving of somebody of no. your knowledge, experience, stature, things well, like that. that. Yeah. So. And, it, and that was it too. And I, I enjoyed the estimating process. I wanted to learn more too. And I was like, I know if I can, there's points of stuff where it's like, I know I can do these things, but I get bored with stuff, you know, not, not saying that anything or work was boring or anything like that, or that I'm some pro that it, it's like, oh, this is below me. I've, I've already done this. this but is, new experiences are yeah, fun. Yeah, new experiences are <laughs> fun. It's something to be able to come into a company that it's not like you had this $8 million company, you had two other estimators, now it's just coming in, getting thrown in as another, you know. You're filling a place body. or something. Yeah. yeah. Like you, wanted, you wanted someone that was also going to be able to help with business development, which, you know, to get to that point and do that, that kind of stuff too, and be part of a, a team that's building a company. Yeah. And that was, that was really what stuck in it. And then just seeing the stuff that you put out, like you're spending time doing these Ask Painter shows mm -hmm. and uh, as well as running this company yeah. and to have that, it was just inspiring, which is, I think a lot of my jobs, I've done a lot of different things, search slay, <laughs> restoring old muscle cars, <laughs> repair jacks and cars, shows and stuff like that, or the auctions. And like, I had, I have to have something that's like, it's not the, not the typical thing because yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just a weirdo. And, and be able to find something where it feels like you're fit, you fit in with these people too, is is awesome. So, but yeah, that kind of, that was kind of the intro, and then we I went off. We did our family our family little family moon honeymoon thing, or just trip after the wedding and after all this craziness of the the summer. And you, I think you called me when I was up the cabin, and I was like, oh, it's Nick. It's like it's just gonna be like, yeah, sorry, man, we did somebody else. <laughs> and you were telling me you're like, can you can you come back down here and uh, uh, can you be here Monday? And I was like. Be home Sunday. I was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. I so I remember it. being very self conscious about that call because it's like <laughs> I knew you were going on the family moon. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, but I got to get this info to him. And he's probably going to think less of me if I bust it because I preach the family yeah. time and the yeah. delineation <laughs> here is like, hey, on the, you know that the most important, coolest vacation ever after you get married? <laughs> yeah, this guy's just going to call you and ask for that time. But no, I had to get the information because I really wanted to set that. That yeah, you, so. no, and I, I think that was the meeting with Justin and Holly uh, yep. Monday, and that was something I was even more intimidated by it because I was like, okay, Nick's pretty cool. We had an awesome conversation. I might have talked to Zero way too much, and he probably thinks I'm an idiot. Um, but now he's wanting me to come back and talk to Justin and Holly, these product managers, which I didn't. I, they could have been a 55 year old guy and a younger exactly. woman, or a, you know, a mix of both. And, and I was like, there's no way that these two can be also as cool <laughs> and like level headed and and professional, but yeah. also not super intimidating, like some of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Not gonna, not gonna, not gonna, 
how dare you come into your, we're not bringing you into this team. And, and it was, it was awesome. I met those two and I was like, God, these, these two are first off are really cool, calm and professional about stuff. And on top of that, I was like, I could be friends with them probably. These are two Open, people. Open, warm, yeah. inviting. Yeah, just good people, good but, people. But also awesome at what they do as yes. a finding out. world like, class. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, yep. so that was like another thing. I was like hammer another nail into the coffin of you know my business at that point and be like, oh, I ain't yeah. coffin, but that yeah. sounds really negative. But it's like, no, I know what this, you mean. This though. is yeah. like, I can, this is worth it now. That's gotten to the point where it's like, now if he was to say, hey, and you can work with us, I can feel comfortable saying yes. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, and, and I mean, you have a lot to look out for. I mean, your future, your family business, your family, your yeah. kids. I mean, that's a that's a big thing. And knowing, I mean, we shouldn't overstate this, that you have to move. Yeah, like, you, you, you can't just, part. yeah, like, like that is probably <laughs> the biggest thing. Like that is a choice where, you know, honestly, nightmare scenario, you're here for three months. Yeah. Nick sold you a bill of goods. This is all a hocus pocus, you know, uh, one of those things. And you got to then now what? Now you're just in this town. Yeah. That's a lot Don't smaller know. reload. Yeah. So it's like there was, I mean, I would never say that I sort of like there was pressure on me, not like yours. You had all the pressure, but I was very, I was like, oh, I better make sure this is airtight, man. If this dude is about to do this. So, I mean, you legitimately moved your family here to this town. Yeah. yeah. I think it was, uh, end of August, I think when we started the process of like hiring, when you said, "Hey, can you come do this?" Mm -hmm. and you're like, and I'm like, "Oh God, now this, is, this is real now." It's go time, yeah. yeah now it's <laughs> and I'm on, you know, finishing up. And I want, I was in that weird torn spot where I was like, I don't want to just tell my other customers like, "Sorry, sorry, bye, we're leaving." Yep. Here's half finished house mm -hmm. or something. So I told you I had to clean, you know, finish things up at a shop in Austin. So I had to, you know, finish cleaning yeah. that out, getting things kind of set up, and then finish up an exterior that was a, turned into a, a giant nightmare. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. This, this exterior, of <laughs> and you're like, how about can you do it in a month? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And I was like, of course I can. Then I, I was like, oh god, what is that? Too? This is this is stupid. This is never gonna work. Sharpens out. your knife when yeah. you got the deadline. Uh, yeah. And I, I think back to that, like that month still some days because like even have a bad day, just like we're we're up here trying still trying to settle into things, and it's like you sold a house, uh, finished up the business. Rent, got out of your rental shop, moved everything out, condensed your business, and yeah. I restored old motorcycles on the side too. And it was like, condense that garage, condense all these little things and try to pack them up into it and then move up to New Prague, which I was, I was telling Brandon, our, our shop manager last yeah. night. I was like, I had never really been west of the I 35. I mean, other than up north and west yeah. or I 90 to South Dakota. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, I hadn't really never been in this area. So I was like, this is the wild west to me, like going up here. I know obviously it's not crazy or anything weird, but it's like this is gonna be something different, and that energized me at the same time. But also, yeah. it's like this this scariness level, but also like yeah. this is cool. This but is it's me. different. I yeah. mean, you know, the, when when I when I got out of the army, I had a truck I paid for cash. Everything I owned fit in half of the back, <laughs> and I had no bills, <laughs> no spouse, no anything. I mean, I, Amy and I were recording at the time, but basically, I was an unattached human being mm -hmm. that could basically. Which way, you, you know, <laughs> but you had a family. Like yeah. That's a, that's a very big consideration. Yeah. So. And that's, and Nikki, my wife, uh, she, like I said, we're two months into being married. So on yeah. top of that, like figuring that life, but we've been together for quite a while and pretty much, you know, married, but it was now official. Um, but yeah, she was great at just help. Like when I came home, like just, ah, oh, this, yeah. and she'd be like, no, no, no. That's this, a lot. Yeah. yeah. She's, yeah. she's got more of the calm collected attitude where she like she she brings me down a lot on to like the world's on fire like yeah just yeah calm yeah. down yep. this is good um we'll get through this and she was man rocked through the whole thing and getting up here and then it and then on top of that so like the whole time you're you're moving and stuff and going to this I was like oh, there's all these things just it's cool Justin Holly cool job sounds cool yeah there's gotta be something. There's gonna be but there's still, armor. Yeah, yeah, there's something that's gonna be like, oh yeah. god, what did I do? Yeah, business is on fire, it's gonna be it's bankrupt and in six and, months. Yeah. Yeah, and we gotta get up here and it's just like <clears throat> continually like I'm learning things. We're working hard, we're doing like learning the trade again, uh, a different part of it. Yes, and, absolutely yeah, evolution of it. And uh it just it was awesome, but it, it fueled it, but it was that was that month I was like it's gonna work. Like, yeah. There's a lot of days where I was like, had the phone and I'm like, man, I don't know if a I can make unknowns. it. October 1st is coming up real fast. <laughs> I'm still working on a house <laughs> on like September 25th. And it's like, and yeah, so it, but it turned out and we like, we made through and it's like, yeah, it was just, uh, it was awesome to feel that. And I, and you know, to be able to make it all happen 
in that time period and then come up here and have it be worth it. Yeah. That's like yeah, the yeah. biggest part. So. But yeah, that's kind of kind of the origin story. I don't know if I'm missing anything on that. No, but, so yeah, I, I want to talk about your impressions of what we do, how yeah. we do, because I I have a certain point of view that I portray out to the world. Almost nobody ever gets an inside look at our business from anybody other than me. I, I was going back through the Ask a Painter archive because this is the first show after the five-year anniversary okay, no, show. No. I've been going through the archive. And honestly, I think there was one, I think Holly has been on a little bit mm -hmm. once. I don't think we've formally done a production manager guest oh, show. Nice, I think once, three and a half years ago, four years ago even, I had two painters on a job site with me and we talked about what it's like to apprentice. So that's, I mean, really that's, that's been a weird thing. So yeah. I tell you what, um, if you have the capability to pull up Facebook on your phone, you mm -hmm. go through the, uh, yeah. see if there's any questions there. I'm going to go through IG and see if there's any questions. And then we'll talk about specifically like what we do every yeah. day. Yeah. So not a problem. Fine. Yeah. I appreciate everybody watching today. Been looking forward to this show for a long time. I'm just, oh. Sure. <laughs> Don't need to hear any more yeah. of that nasally drone that we have. To, so, all right. If you see a question you like, let's yeah, do it. Let's see. We can go through it, especially if they're oil primer questions. Uh, question yet. So I should say while well, Andy's looking to um, link link to the master's classes in the uh, in the actual show notes here. Um, the Northeast tour is coming up, but there's smatterings all over the place. Um, there's probably somewhere between five and eight to nine already on the books, but we're already in the works of doing a whole bunch more. We're talking, um, I think Surf Prep is hosting one in California for sure. We have a Southeast thing going on, a mini tour there. Florida is in the works. Austin, Texas is in the works. We just started initiating uh, Colorado, Iowa, things like that. So again, if you are interested, email me, nick at nickslavic.com, and just raise your hand, and we can get the process started. So, Andy, you see yeah. anything you yeah. like in there? Yeah, uh, Jay Osborne says, uh, hi, Nick, how you should do my estimates by eyeing it, walking through and figuring out how much time and materials it's going to take, pose the measuring, et cetera, thoughts. So that's kind of a question. That's going to take yeah. as the first one, and we'll move through. But. So that's how everybody does it, right? And yeah. that's honestly how I did it up until a couple years ago, because I, you've heard me say this a bunch of times, but... We can be master crafts people. And I, I hear people self-proclaim they're master crafts people, master estimators, master production managers. I don't think you can truly be a master unless you have to teach it to somebody else. And honestly, my sword got sharpened when I had to teach <laughs> this thing to you. Yeah. yeah. My sword got sharp. My <laughs> sword got sharpened when I had to teach production to yeah. Holly two and a half years ago. And my sword got sharpened when I had to teach painters how to paint. So I truly believe I've seen myself mature in a certain way as a leader with that. And so not bad. Okay. So most of our industry does that, mm -hmm. you know, and most of the time, honestly, it's not bad. The only problem is there's no job costing to back it. So that sniff test that you do is probably half price. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, I've done it. You've done it. We've all, we've all been there. It's like, Hey, I didn't, I didn't go bankrupt the last time I did this. So moving on. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, like back to when I asked you about bedroom costing and stuff like that, I was half your price probably yeah. back then. And I, I, I bring home enough money to survive on, I feel like. And, and you were in a, and you were located in a town three times my size. Yeah. And you were honestly, I wish I could have subcontracted where you did it. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, no, arm down there. <laughs> I have done this. You have done this. Yeah. And we basically gave the clients the best deal on the planet. We mm -hmm. murdered ourselves for them. We, we made the equivalent of probably $21 an hour at the end of it. When really you and I could have got a job at another painting company and made $30 an hour <laughs> with no risk, no insurance, yep. no estimates. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the state of our industry. The common thing is, if I can make $25 an hour working for rainbow painting, yeah. whatever, well, if I can just make 30 on my own, why don't do that? But you're not understanding. There's probably a 20 to $25 added cost of running your own business. Yeah. So if you want to make 30, you need to charge 55, you know, and that's the thing that people are missing. So if your sniff test is good and you job cost, and I truly, there's two numbers that, that I put out to the industry, which is, if you have a, a, a professionalized company of somewhere eight plus painters, they need to be producing $55 of revenue an hour. So you send a painter out for 10 hours, they need to somehow create $550 of value for the client. 
If you're an owner operator, I believe it should be at least double that, honestly, because you and I uh, in a phase, like even now when I exit my office and get out to the field, my job costing on weird little projects that I take on are somewhere between 90 and $200 of revenue an hour because we have decades of experience. We know this, nobody's going to work harder or faster. So honestly, if, if you're in a single owner operator and you're only making $55 an hour, I believe you're leaving half the money on the table because you're good, you're fast, you're thoughtful. Nobody is going to give a service like you. And it's not that you're charging twice as much. You're creating twice as much value. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And that's, and that's a hundred percent why at my point, at my end of my business, the, and without like, so without job costing, I think it was the first month I was here. Uh, we had that little mini yes. class. Yeah. The job right here. Yeah. And I, I took my last three jobs, you know, interior jobs and kind of job costing. I was like, oh, well, <laughs> this is eye opening. And most, most painters create a job for themselves with yeah. a whole ton of risk. And yeah. that's, and it's not, so this is, this is never me saying, and you, you know me now where this is not me saying, get out there and just lay waste to the, the charge three times. Yeah. No, it's like, listen, you're already providing the value provide for your family, yeah. provide for your future. Most painting businesses go out of business one to three years. Mm -hmm. The average business owner makes $43,000 a year. <laughs> That's not a good problem. That's $22 an hour. Most of our painters make more than $22 exactly. an hour. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous. Yep. And that's, you know, me, me and Brandon <laughs> talked about that yesterday too. Was, we were just kind of talking, getting to know each other. And uh, and at lunch together, everybody else was kind of like, God, man, you know, if I had probably known about you 10 years ago, not once again, he's my dad's listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I probably would have came up and worked, got it at a painting job because it's like, yeah, the risk. Six reward. years ago, if yeah. somebody would have came to me and offered yeah. me something, I might have taken that choice exactly. too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I probably would have got to a certain point where it's like, yeah, you know, I would like more. And the thing is, like, that's not even, yeah, a whole other thing. But yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the sniff testing and stuff, we get a lot of crap sometimes too because I used to measure every little. Mm -hmm chink and little spot in the in the armor on a room like what is what's going to slow me down and what am i going to exactly. what's and you, you know, fixate on yeah, all the little minutia of a job so many yeah. doors in a room and my estimate sheet was like this like a, a rubik's cube of trying yeah. to put things together yeah. it's like and then you get down to it and you're like oh, all right that sounds good half price yeah <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad actually had a really a really good way of doing stuff he would take and really good but probably still should have Taking fifty percent and added on to everything, but he would do day equivalents. Oh so yeah, kind of, yeah. So we, do, we talk about that a lot yeah. too. Your old man's a smart guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> day equivalents, and then he would do square footage, like yep. picking yep. from um, you know a, a source of online stuff and old yeah. manuals that had like old union manuals that said this it takes this long to paint window casing, yeah. it takes this long, and this is what you should, you know, and then attach an hourly charge to it. And then there was a third one where it was just like, how oh, we've done these jobs a few times. How what, how much you think it should be? So you can, so it's three of them, and then he would take all those and then average it out. Which then in the end, it's like <laughs> so. Which is awesome because you know what? I've taken twenty nine years of experience, put it into a master's class, one of the most popular ones on estimating, and I call it the triangulation method. Yeah. Your old man came up with the same thing. <laughs> yeah. We go we go on production rates, experience, yeah. and market rate, and that's how you and I come up with the stuff there. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that production mm -hmm. rates. Are, is arguably the most transferable, the most transparent. Yeah. Like if you had to hire a person who doesn't know what a paintbrush is to estimate houses, you production rates would be the best. Yeah. You measure a bedroom, you times your production rate, you get a price. Yeah. That's the McDonald's method. You, you can take somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and turn out a standardized product. The problem is in our company, who's production rate? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> we are, we make our bones by taking people off the street who never even considered the trades and put them in. So do you estimate 200, yeah. $200 an hour? Do you estimate $10? I mean, so our production rates are so varied and we have master crafts people in our company. Do you use theirs? Yeah. Do you use the people who are almost are out of year, almost to graduate the apprenticeship? So that's the problem with production in my company. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the thing that you can't. If you have a standardized workforce, if, if you have 20 subcontractors, they're probably going to produce at a standard rate. Good measure. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, and that's the thing like I, and they like, you know, benefit of working here, like coming in and our estimating, there's change or there little things that were different for me and you. Um, and we even get that too when we're in houses sometimes, like a bedroom, people walk in, oh, and they're yeah. like, all right, where's your, where's your tape measure? Yeah. It's like, well, you've seen a standard bedroom how many times now? This is 
pretty standardized. We had these, we had these conversations early on. Mm -hmm. You ever been surprised? No. Sometimes they're 13, sometimes they're 15. Yeah. One closet, one to two windows, two doors. Yep. Sometimes three doors. Move on. It's, it's <laughs> one. And then there's the master that has, oh, there's a little vault. Yep. And yeah, a little bit of that triangle that's not gonna one out of three hundred, you get a Lake Minnetonka home. Where it's there's a couch in the yes, you know, and there's a yeah. fireplace and it's like another living room, but it's still just a room equivalent. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's like there's back to the question. Yeah, question, yeah sorry. We'll no, but but the question basically is the one bit, the one thing you can do. The, the world of price is a mystery to most people, yeah. right? Not to us anymore because we we think about this intently. The world of price is a mystery until you job cost. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy. It doesn't matter what you charge, what I charge, what anybody else charges. If you made money on your last job and you figure out job costing, material percentage and labor percentage, you have a data point that says, if I charge this again and I perform the same way, I make money. Mm -hmm. The best thing about job costing is if you if you come back and it's $21 of revenue an hour, you're like, oh, I'm doubling that yeah. price next time <laughs> for sure. Or did I order the wrong paint? Did I paint the room? You know, you can look back and say, you can adjust your prices. We did this. So this is, and people say 29 years of experience, mm -hmm. a decade and a half of experience. Like you guys are still, listen, we started drywall and carpentry. <laughs> it, it took about six months for us to basically dial in our prices from, we don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. We've never done it. We get some data, we job cost the stuff. And based on that few data points we have, we change our pricing. Mm -hmm. We get some more data points. We change it. You can reiterate if you paint three bedrooms and you job cost each within three bedrooms, you'll be able to tell what you should charge for the fourth. Yep. That's that's something I never and it's <laughs> and job costing. I'm sure people, some of the painters hear that stuff and they're like, oh my God, what is that? Dry as burnt toast. Yeah, but the thing is it's it's simplified. Yep. I mean, especially the your system on doing that stuff. It, it's a few I'm I'm not a number, I mean I'm a numbers guy, but I'm not I'm not a math whiz by any means. No. And or an accountant, but doing this stuff, it just it's like opening that mystery bag. You're like, oh, this, this it's is so unsexy and so unsatisfying to hear. What do you charge for X? One of the greatest things we had early on was. Um, then we'll get to some more questions. Yeah. Remember that big commercial job that we both went to yeah. again. 29 years, people are like, well, Nick, you got all the data, all this. I never did one of those, but within an hour, we came up with a price because yeah. it's a it's a it's a commercial building, which we've done before, but it had that crazy block where it's the in and out, the mm -hmm. U block. I've done small bits of that. I've never done a 30,000 square foot building. <laughs> I mean, so you're looking at something that could potentially use ten thousand dollars of paint or twenty-two thousand dollars of paint. Which one? So what, what we did was something really sneaky, which is we know job costing. We try to keep materials at 15% of the job. We measured the building. Yeah. We figured out how much paint we think it could use. That's 15%. And yeah. then we just, what is it? Divide by 0.15 or whatever. Yeah. And that says, well, if you want to keep materials at 15%, you're going to have to charge as much revenue. We yeah. snuck into yeah. a revenue number based on that because we job cost. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's yeah. like I said, it's that. That one missing piece that I think a lot of painters could benefit so so much from, and it's not intimidating. To, 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 I wish I could make it more clear to people that it's not intimidating. I mean, it, it sounds intimidating until you start. You're doing out. this already in your head. Yeah. How many times have you been painting a house outside, and you're like on day six, and you're like, wait a We're second here. These gallons. <laughs> I only charge six grand for this house. I'm on day six, so best case scenario, before I pay for paint, I'm making a thousand dollars a day, and I'm seeing six more days of work. Now I'm only making five hundred a day. Yep. So you can you can say, well, but wait, if I finish it in in two more days, then I'm making seven hundred dollars. We're doing this. Mm -hmm. You have this stuff. You have paint receipts. You have what you charge, yeah. and you know how many hours it took you on a job, even just days. All this is there. We're, this isn't an app. It's not a book. Yeah. This stuff is already here. You just have to squeeze it together, yep. you know? Yeah, that's uh, hopefully that answers you. But we, the, the data did, mm -hmm. so yes, and yeah, we'll, we'll get to <laughs> but the data answers a lot of questions for us because at every single leadership team meeting, data plus feelings. <laughs> and one of the one of the things that I have to be in charge of in this is the 10,000 foot data plus feelings because remember, we had this conversation where I look perplexed at about three meetings in a row. It's like, this job costing is just like, <laughs> I mean, we might be the best painting company in the United States. I'm seeing these numbers come in. I'm like, our people are awesome. Sniff test. I need to look further. Yeah. And we found out that there was hours that we're paying for that weren't getting on our job costing because it was a painter was cleaning something out or a sprayer broke down or there was drive time and that stuff didn't get 
uh, a sign there, but it has to, right? Yeah, because that's all, for it. if somebody's being paid for something, it's gotta be on there. So the sniff test revealed that we did a quick reconciliation of the numbers. Two weeks later, it's all fixed. Yep. You know what I mean? But if we didn't have that data, even if we job costed and didn't do critical thinking, I would have just been 10 X baby, <laughs> killing it, killing it, you know, all oh, hundred dollar uh, bills, yeah. you know, and you'd just Over be like, and at the end of the year, when, when you actually had to reckon with the tax man, you'd be like, yeah, where's those like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> never mind those hundred posts yeah. about killing it you know so but that's where the data data plus feelings we yeah. dwell in that sort of thing and especially when we get oh we'll, we'll talk yeah. about <laughs> yeah. next if there's another question yeah, no, let's see <laughs> uh let's see here we go Dave, David Coles, I do all of our estimates honestly if you haven't painted you don't know what to look for in terms of project game chain of project game changers. That's, yeah, that's I, is he that's saying awesome. you need experience to do that? Um, I don't know. It's just, it's just Dave Cole says, I do all of our estimates. Honestly, if you haven't painted, you don't know what to look for in terms of project game changers. But I will absolutely push back on that. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, I like to so back to the train, taking someone off the street and knowing your numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and knowing, once again, if you're not, some, there's certain things, like I said, coming vaulted ceilings. I don't know if that's what he's speaking of, like little things that are going to be. Maybe. Yeah. Or. Maybe or you can almost say, what if, Andy, what if our backgrounds in painting actually hamstring us yeah. because of that? I could because you're looking too deep into stuff. And I, I did you're, that. You're yeah. looking too deep, but you also have this wealth of if you and I five years ago would have been asked to estimate, we would have still fire sold all our work <laughs> because that's what we're doing. You take somebody from outside of the industry and they may just say, well, I don't know. I had my house painted a while ago. Somebody else charged me double or wait a second, you're going to put 300 hours into that. You're only charging six grand. Like I, I'm just doing a sniff. You know, yeah. when you take a critical thinker from outside, sometimes we're burdened by this knowledge, yeah. Oh, yeah. good and bad. Because when I, when I sell a entry door restoration, I could sell it super cheap because I can produce $200 of revenue an hour, provide a lot of stuff. But when we give it to our employees who haven't got 29, yeah. then all of a sudden it lights a business on fire. So you can actually hurt yourself by a lot mm -hmm. of that stuff. Whose production rates Yeah, and mm -hmm. stuff. I had that problem where it's like, as I got better <coughs> in the trade, there'd be certain things I knew I could do faster. And it's like, oh, I can keep that cheaper because I'm giving uh, giving a benefit to the customer. And it's like, wait a second. But <laughs> is, accountability is a good thing. Yeah. Holly was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. Justin was a data analyst. They are arguably some of the most high speed, world class production managers yes. in our industry. I think they're actually better because they don't have some of the baggage. Yeah. Now, if you could sprinkle in, deep coding science knowledge too it wouldn't hurt but you don't need i mean it's no, not no, it's not necessary you know what i mean no and that's the thing too like when you took me on or you were like something like this could be a dumpster fire or it might yeah, work but you're probably thinking the same thing about and, me <laughs> and the you know there's days where i call you on certain things where i'm you know the head trash is all yeah. there and it's like oh god like nick this has got this thing going on this and you're like we've got this now <laughs> so the, the best example i can give you is how many gallons do this yeah. Holly never has to ask that. No. Justin never asked that. No, that's they don't right. have this head trash about what if you order this? What? No, they go by the cold hard data. They don't have this heart in the paint order. Mm -hmm. they, it's a <laughs> clinical thing they have to do. They look at a house. They look at the last three they did. Yeah. You order this much paint. When painters are all like, oh, what did you do? What? It's just a clip. It's one of those things they get up and do like eating breakfast, yeah. you know, and there's no head trash or weight with it. You know, they, they absolutely like, and that was another thing when I came on, I was like, oh, this is, this is super interesting on top of that because except I met both of them at the interview and they told me kind of what their backgrounds as well. Yeah. And it's like hey, you're doing all the paint order and you're doing all yeah. these things. And I I've, I'm so lucky that we have them like and you feel the same way, I'm sure. But then that they're standing behind us and all this stuff. And I can go and estimate and it's like I don't have to worry, I can just hand it off to them and they take care of these things that are a beautiful I've, system is a client says to us, please do our project. We hit one email, it goes off into the production side of the business, mm -hmm. and you're just like, they're going to be taken so well care of yep. at this point. You know, yeah, so it's, it's a just, good thing. Yeah, and it makes you us more confident in our bidding process because it's like, I don't have to worry about all these things now. I don't have to go and be like, and you sure, I'm sure, same way. And same with our painters, they don't have to worry about paint, a quarter in paint. Like, that's that used to be such, like, if I go back to my business, you go into a paint store and that's a two hour thing sometimes. You can run into someone you know, or the, the paint manager, the paint stores, um, the manager is a talkative guy and he wants to tell you about his fishing trip. And it's like you're Three edging, orders edging before to the door. Yeah. It's like, I gotta get back to work. Yeah. I would love to sit and talk all day, but it's- 100% like, of production is shut down right yep, now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so, but anyway, yeah. I would, 
I, I actually am in the final stages of creating a master's class about myths in our industry. That's one of them where I use data and feelings to dispel all these myths. Even the thing about full-size trucks versus vans. <laughs> Even the things about how many painters do you need to take to replace yourself and make the same income. There's a whole bunch of non-critical thinking going on. And these are all these weird myths, you yeah. know, about where price comes from and things like that. So basically it's like a myth buster sort of like thing. But anyway, yeah. yeah. No, he has a follow-up thing. He goes, I need some terms and conditions wording, not so much around payments, but it's executing the project, which you probably could help him with, I'm sure. If he, if he is he looking for like templates or yeah, so obviously you can always email me nick at nickslavic.com and we can give you a data point. But yeah. what we do, Andy, is something a little different where I um I don't we don't do down payments yeah. and we don't do contracts, which is probably not advisable, right? Yeah. Like yeah. most, so the problem is like data plus feelings. The data is most other painting companies don't do that, right? They take they take down payments to get on the schedule and they have a very long Apple iPhone-ish contract, very legalese that nobody reads. I've always taken the tack that we don't have a problem with people not paying us. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need a down payment. We don't have a lot of people who back out of the schedule, so we don't necessarily need a down payment. And I feel like if you're trying to go for trust with the client, a simple, colorful one page FAQ that we just simply ask them to acknowledge they've read with a signature at the bottom mm -hmm. is the least contracty thing ever. It keeps it light. It keeps it refreshing. And all it is, is, is dealing with their house, not indemnity, not yeah. right to refuse. I mean, there's not any of that stuff. So paint's not going to tear a wall down or make your house fall. Apart exactly. The time. <laughs> and, and the thing that we know is if you go to the contract, you've already failed. Mm -hmm. And that's, and the, yeah, and that's the thing. If you can design a business around not having that as your backstop, mm -hmm. either being like, well, that's it. You signed the contract. This is what we're doing. Tough luck. I was given a 17 page contract once by another painter and asked me to review it for him. And I just said, sorry. This feels this feels punitive. Like if, if 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 a plumber came to my house and was going to change out a toilet, and maybe sign a seventeen page contract. It's like, oh, something bad's going to happen here. Yeah, why do we need? I, this? I may I may not own my house at the end of this. You know what I mean? This seriously. Yeah. So another another thing too is there's this. I, I love patterns, and that's my job in the company to find patterns, sniff it out like the job costing. Yeah. One pattern is everybody is stuck perpetually in problem solution. And as a leadership team, I force us to get out of problem solution. <laughs> we order too much paint, we do this. We order too little paint, we do this. How about we design a system that just completely gets around it? I always say three steps up. Yep. I need a contract for what? Well, clients don't like our paint coating. It's like, maybe you're using the wrong paint. Three steps up, maybe change your paint so you never have to go to the contract and you never have a failure. That's what I'm interested in. That's what you're interested no, in too. That's, we've had that discussion recently. Simple, about that. simple systems that never fail are predictable. You and I would much rather create a system that is simple, leaves the 17 page out, but 99% of people can comply and deliver a simple system yeah. versus here's the most Rube Goldberg, perfect, beautiful thing nobody can comply with. So nobody does it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and that's what humans are. No. I've designed my business knowing that. I cannot do, I cannot create my own custom software and comply with it. So we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I create these very simple things that I know I can comply. Simplest system in my life is email. <clears throat> my to-do list is email. Yeah, which I haven't put on Ben and to just so not it's simple. It's I've simple. tried every to-doist. I've tried all the apps. I've tried everything else. The only thing that I automatically default to is email. So guess what? I throw hurdles in my way and I can't get around them. So again, creating that know thyself, right? Yep, so. exactly. And it's in simplicity too. And that's, I did that whole game too. I try not estimating things, but you will get some more questions. What else you got? Yeah, let's see what I, at some point. Um, Ted Sharp, I'm assuming now at some at some point you are the, are with the data points with real time tracking your estimated cost versus your actual cost in order to maintain or tweak costs to remain profitable and run a healthy business, which is kind of job costing, right? Essentially, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that so the one thing that people focus on, and the one thing that is one of the most useless data points that you and I mm -hmm. <clears throat> take interest in on the painter internet is what's your charge rate. Who cares? What's your production rate? <laughs> like all these, all these people, like listen, celebrate wins, right? Yeah. Sold a hundred thousand dollars of work this week. How much you produce? You and I, we know we have to do a very metered sort of thing because right now everybody's production constrained. You and I mm -hmm. could you and I could go out there and sell legitimately 
You could probably sell one five. I could probably do that. We could sell $3 million of work. We're not going to produce 3 million. Yeah. So we need to be very thoughtful about how we do that stuff. It doesn't matter what you sell. No, that's what you you and I have sold more than a million dollars worth of work so far. The yeah. biggest thing is what you produce. Exactly. <laughs> that's the whole thing where it's like, what's your charge rate? I, I see guys out there charging $200 of revenue an hour. They only produce 40. So what's your real... Yeah, what's your charge rate is a is a make believe number now. <laughs> and what traction is? What is your production rate? What are your people? Every hour you pay for, how much revenue is being produced? Yeah. Bradford Sauer says, uh, how many cost codes do you use? Which I'm guessing like line item cut like per. Yeah. So yeah. again, we like we are we cannot use production rates in this company. I have deep production rates on myself, our people, everything else. I don't know who's going to be on the job. How do you estimate it? So what we do is, is something that's very unsatisfying, which is market rate, mm -hmm. which is a better way to estimate, but a harder, higher risk, higher reward. We basically, because you and I do so many estimates, we're probably doing 30, mm -hmm. 35 yeah, that's in a week, yeah. at the most 40 estimates a week. That gives us 40 data points every week as to, oh my God, people were just in tears because they want us to do it so quick. And it's like, well, maybe we can... We use SR, right? Yeah. So if if we sell half of our work, 50% success rate, if we sell half of our work, that's a pretty good indication based on the laws of economics in our industry. If half the people will take you and half don't, you're sort of, that's you're getting right. there. You're getting there. Now, tons of variables. What's interesting is that your SR is much lower than that, lower than our goal we put for you. But your average job size is like three times as yeah. high as what we're going for. So what the difference is you're selling less work, but the work you're selling is of greater value. So again, you play with these numbers, like you may look at a, an estimator or a salesperson and say, oh my God, the, the industry average is 50. He's only doing 33, fire him. Like, oh no, he's actually doing better than that. So you can play with the numbers and make all this stuff work. So. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but, but those cost codes, again, the problem is we have such a data set, like we're still honing in some drywall numbers too. We do so many estimates. We do so many jobs that we can basically look at the job costing and say, yeah, we're is, going by market rate. Yep. You know, like what, what, what is the reaction of clients? And the final arbiter is, can you physically fill your company with work? We know if we sold a bedroom for $75, we could really fill the company yeah. with work. But at <laughs> what point can you get to 50 SR and still keep your company with work? That's our market rate. Yeah. Uh, what, see, when you mentioned uh, that your paint and materials cost should be 15%, is that based off total cost of your project? If so, we have many projects where paint costs are much more than that. And mm -hmm. unless we resort to junk paint, what else could we do? You can paint faster. <laughs> I mean, the unsexy answer is that. Yeah. So two, two data points for that person is fences and stucco projects. Fence projects, if you ever wanted to use 40 gallons of stain on something you think you need four gallons for, a fence, right? Yep. Like So Easy. when we do fence projects, the material cost will be very high, but the labor will be very low in, in, a court, in, in equivalent to that, in comparison to that. Same with stucco, locks on XP. My God, a hundred gallons will do a small house. So you're gonna have a higher thing, but again, the, your labor should be lower equivalent. So we've seen we've seen uh, material expenses very high, but that's why we job cost. And again, it's not the individual. We actually job cost to the point where the sales team has a percentage that we need to hit, about six and a half percent right now. Production has the same thing. Yeah, They have a percentage based on the revenue. So. The final arbiter of all this for a larger company is 45% gross profit, which means basically you have 40%, 40 points of labor to play with, 15 points of material to play with. If material goes up to 40, your labor should go down to 15%. The final arbiter is that gross profit. That's the real number. So don't look, people think that they're going to make profit by paint. Yeah. yeah. Small percentage. Beating Benjamin Moore and Sherwin and Hirschfield's up isn't going to make you profitable. It's all labor. 40% of every dollar that you produce is going to go to some type of labor if you do everything right. A lot of paint companies, 60% mm -hmm. of that goes to labor. So, and people are worrying about the paint price. Just this, yeah, how many points on uh, a job usually? I mean, that's that's a battle with like some new new construction constantly with these flat paint and you know, <laughs> builders flat and stuff like that. It just it comes down to the cost of the house. 
and really yep. how much does using a couple steps above that yep. really cost you or the customer? So I actually use a fence in my in my estimating and job costing master's classes. I use a fence as a data plus feelings thing because if you don't job cost, I, I take an actual example from a bunch of years ago where I charge fifteen hundred bucks to do this one line of fence, and I use seven hundred dollars of material on it. The data or the feelings from that sort of thing is, oh my, half the money went to stain? That's insane. But it took me six hours. Yeah. So the final job costing was $70 of revenue an hour, which is like you would always do that job again oh. based on the data, yeah. based on the feelings. I'm never doing a fence again. So that's where you need to. So same mm -hmm. thing. It's not the cost of the stain. You need to do that gross profit number to actually figure out. Let's see. Oh, that was a long question. Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I love right. that. <laughs> most of my things. One of the most important items that I can always include in investments are an excluded category. I used to run into issues where you ask a customer if they want to their bill code door painted, and they say no until once you are done painting, and then they say it was included. The exclusion category saves me, saves my ass all, all the time. Yeah, when we do that too. So we, again, we, we dwell on simple, right? So uh, some people write estimates that are five pages long and there's a paragraph description under each one. We're going to do this to this and this, and that's, that's fine. That's not bad. What we like is here is a, we have never given an estimate more than one page. Yeah. It is a thing you look at and it's got colors on it and it's pretty. And there's a line that says bedroom. And then there's a couple options, walls, ceiling, trim, cabinets, miscellaneous, and there's just a number. There's no description. You and I believe in the simplicity. A client wants that one simple number. Now, the problem is you can't just say outside of house this because then you run into the bill code doors. <laughs> yeah. and, oh, what about the vent pipe on the roof? Or what about the flashing? What about the... So you and I break the outside of a house down into about eight different things. And we basically, you know, foundation, windows, soffit fascia, gutters. And it's basically like prep and paint or no finishes. Prep and paint and no... And it's simple, but it's still all of that. But it's like this binary thing. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. It's so easily digested. Absolutely. Yep. And there's always, so you can never contract yourself into a perfect agreement. You can never estimate yourself into something because there's always something. The hose spigot was painted before, but we don't normally paint hose spigots. And they're going to ask you to paint it. Change order. <laughs> or you could just, <laughs> you could just paint it. Yeah, it's like, is it going to break you? If that hose spigot made you go from 45% GP to 44%, there's other things you could focus, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, hammer temple. What are the FAQs you ask? Those are more so on our, what customers would be asking us on our info sheet. Yeah. Our info sheet is basically a 29 year condensation of FAQs, which is anything that we've ever been asked. It's, it's, it's a contract, but in a conversational bulleted point tone that says, you know, we move the furniture. We need you to, we need you to, you know, if you take a nail out of the wall, we patch it. If we find a nail in the wall, we leave it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we clean up after ourselves. If you want us to get rid of a whole bunch of trash, there's a charge for that down below. If you need help with color, there's this, here's our promises to you. It's, it's just simple sort of like everything we've ever been asked condensed down there. So, and it's a one page. And typically when you go out and give an estimate, you got the little mobile command unit and estimate on the front info sheets printed on the back. And it's, it's color coded. Yeah. Our, our, our estimate paper matches our uniforms. Yeah. Like everything is uniform. You know what I mean? Like, so it's all there. Everything we, yeah. you, you, you do this masterful thing where you walk through a house and within an hour or two, you can hand them an estimate for inside, outside trim, ceiling, cabinet, walls, popcorn removal, mm -hmm. all on one page with a simple info sheet on the back, hand it to them on site. Yeah. Walk away. No, no 17 pages, no two weeks later. And, and it's Contract. just, yeah, that's that was something too. I mean, when we when I did estimates too, like the the turnaround time was a killer. Um, I mean, not a killer, but it, you do it and doing it all at once is even when I've had ones where it's like I've got questions on something or we I, we need to con confirm on something. Yeah. It's not fresh in your head anymore. Even if it's an hour or two later, it's like oh, there's this little piece that you yep. miss or there's something they ask you during the you know walkthrough, and if you would have had it right there, been done. And it's not. I don't think it's all about closing either. I think a lot of people think. You know, just seeing other shows sometimes and it's thinking that of advantage or something. Yeah, yeah, or that we're forcing it. You know, like here, here's our. Well, we don't ask for the sale. No, that's another that's, thing people don't understand. Like yeah. we're not sitting there. There's no bonus for closing on the spot yeah. for either of us. Like we, I would prefer we don't mm -hmm. ask but, them if they have any questions. Move on. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Did you say your price bids? Did you say your price bids so 
So that 50% get accepted, Jamie Ness. Yeah, it depends. So there's, again, unsatisfying answers. There's lots of variables. Mm -hmm. um, my SR for last year was 47%. I sold 1.725 million, give or take. Um, so that's the standards I put forth to you. You are not currently meeting the SR standards, but your average job size, I set out a goal that was a high goal. You're, you've at least doubled that. So again, maybe SR doesn't work, but maybe average job size goes up. So you, you're selling half the amount of jobs for the same amount of money that I was selling. So really, you might be doing better. <laughs> so, but that's, the SR is just one data point there to help you make choices. Uh, if I was a single person painter who only got all their work off of Instagram and you don't have to employ anybody and you're booked out till October, I would basically expect an SR of 80 or 90%. Yeah. You should, when I was at the single person stage, the only people that came to me were people who already self-selected word of mouth referral. They didn't get a postcard. They didn't get a mailer. They already wanted something done. They've really, unless I throw up on their shoes, they're probably going to hire me or unless I charge some ungodly rate. Yeah. So your SR should be much higher. So when, there's two sets of benchmarks in our industry. One is for the single owner operator, which really, if you create $200,000 of revenue, you should be taking home a hundred and your SR should be 80 or 90% yeah. because these people are coming to you. Now, Half of our business is word of mouth and referral and our close rate is much higher. But in order to drive this machine and create apprenticeship and things like that, we need to go out there and pay for advertising that brings in strangers yeah. and our SR is lower on those, but that's how business works. Right? So <laughs> that's, and I can, that was hundred percent of the way my dad made me. That was, I think we paid for one. I told you for one newsper ad and mm -hmm. I think he mistakenly puts another thing in the yellow pages once, which uh, brought in a whole different kind of clientele. Um, it's a different demo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then the, our, our close ratio was probably like, so that 75, 85% in the, between there. The interesting thing is um, we track SRs for different forms. Word of mouth referral is higher. Uh, Facebook is very low. There's a lot of looky loose, which isn't a judgment call, which isn't bad, but the people who are serious about getting their house painted is much lower, at least in the near future, on uh, on Facebook and Instagram than on somebody who sees my postcards. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's that's where you have to say, well, is 50% SR good? I would say if you're getting 50% of your word of mouth referral jobs, you're either super high priced or you're not doing a great job. I would yeah. say it should be higher than that, you know? And if you got 50% of the jobs that you got postcard mailers off, you'd be number one in the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. You know, <laughs> strangers. That's exactly. Yep. That's... See anything else interesting? Yeah. How many steps of reasoning before you figure out not to take a new client? That is difficult. We let them self-select, right? Yeah. yeah. So what what girls. what is the scale we use, Andy? Uh, yeah. PBC. PBC. People be crazy. Yep. And and then the thing is, that we're not hunting them out. We're not looking for reasons to disqualify. Mm -hmm. We just like said, put those hurdles up to say, here's what we can provide. Here's how we do it. If you're gonna not kick those hurdles down instead of hop over them with us. Yeah. We're probably not gonna be a good fit. So every, every, so what we can say and data plus feelings, the data is we have a proven process to make people happy, right? If somebody says we came to you, we want our cabinets painted. We have this process that never once has failed. If that client says that's great, but I would like you to use this product. Then we say, well, now we can't, now we're just in no man's land. Like I've been doing this for 29 years. You have a ton of, experience as well. We know how to do this. We have tried everything. We have done everything. I know the molecular structure of oil primer. If you want to use something else, the statistical probability of your happiness will go down yeah. vastly. And the problem is nobody's rational enough to take that into account later on in that project and say, you know what? These cabinets completely failed. They didn't meet it, my expectations, but you know what? I told you what to use. So all's forgiven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you no. laugh because that's, that's like, you told me you were going to, it's like, okay, we only have to do a few of those before we say, listen, we don't want to be cold hearted serial killers here, but you either do our system or you don't. And we have to be mature enough to then say, if you aren't interested in our system, you just have to find somebody else because we know what's at the end of this road. Yeah. You don't, you know? go, to, you don't go to Jimmy John and say, I like all your meat, but I want you to put it on this bread. I brought my own chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Please do make it work. And yeah. then when it comes out, no, it doesn't taste as good. Well, everything I got good. sick. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you brought your own chicken, <laughs> yeah. dumb dumb. Yeah, it's like it doesn't work that way. It's no. like go yeah, somewhere else. Go to McDonald's if you want that. Hair so. professionals for a reason kind of thing. It, but but it's tough because you can't blame the clients yeah. either. I have an empathetic heart and you do too, because it's the wild west. Yeah. There is no standardized product. If you if you want a sandwich, you go to Jimmy John's. If you want a burger, you go to Burger King. 
there is no difference. How do you know when you when you hire a painter? Like who uses Ilva? Who uses Scuffex? Who uses crappy wall paint on cabinets? You know what I mean? It's like everybody's the Wild West, non-standardized. The prices are all over the place. People estimate differently. So rightly so. Sometimes I don't blame the clients when they say, you know what? I, I'm just going to go buy the good paint because I feel like you're going to go buy that chalk in a can. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I honestly don't blame them, but I always try to get them to just come to a rational decision of we are the good ones. Yeah. And we've, I've, like I said, you've done the same thing. We test these products, we give things a chance. It's not like we're sold on, we're, you know, having that back pocket going, oh, Benjamin Moore or Sherwin Williams is telling us to do this and this is why we're using it. We're doing it because we found these work. This is what gives you. A good product and we don't we don't want to put something on that's going to get a call back and say hey by the way our cabinets are it's consistent off sheets yeah that's not something we enjoy or want it's, it's absolutely consistent yeah. and and honestly it, you and i know this but this is a client care company mm -hmm. we just happen to paint people's houses you know and interestingly enough like i took fresh alex one of our crafts people uh he had to gotten a snowboarding injury and so i took him around with estimates for me for a week and honestly at the end of that week he was like nobody cares about paint no. like none, none and that's that's like well, they yeah. obviously care because they want a paint job but nobody asked questions about paint or even process they cared about so how do i choose color color is always number one right mm -hmm. who moves the furniture i'm a 78 year old widow yeah. who's gonna move this credenza you know and then it's cleaning up we have an electrician in here he left me a little pile of dust and wire ends and now I get to do that yeah. when I come home from a long day of work. We focus completely on delivering however we can create a process to make a happy client. Yeah, that's the, and I, I think they've said, and on top of that, time wise, when can, you, when can you do it? That's now the Minnesota you know, spring conundrum to um, an irrational point. Yeah. And, and, but again, empathetic because people, people in Minnesota, if, if you and I could wave the magic wand over the industry and, and our clients, we would take the thousand percent demand right now and sprinkle it over december and january a little bit yeah, when when basically we're diving to keep our people busy and now it's too much and now people are actually getting angry with us that we can't get to them sooner and it's like you know what yeah, that warm body six too. months of the year we break ourselves to try to fill a schedule and now it's just there's 10 times too much work and it's not the client's fault no. this is how minnesota works but we wish we could spread out the demand curve a little bit <laughs> for <laughs> their sure, sake <laughs> yeah i'm sure every painter out there that feels the seasonal stuff and, is thinking we, the same thing we have the capacity right now our lead times are never going to be bigger but we can still at least get to people fairly quickly yeah. single painter andy and nick Two years booked out in advance. Yeah. And we used to think that was a hallmark. I'm oh, killing yeah. two years booked out in advance. <laughs> yeah, I, would, too, I would love to see the likelihood of somebody booked out 17 months from now actually doing that job. Mm -hmm. And it, that, for me, it didn't really. No, I, we, my dad used to, we sometimes, I, I wish I could call a friend right now um, and see what, because he used to, when we first started, it was when we were doing exteriors pretty much only in the yeah. summers. We were really touching interior work. Um, he was usually a year. I mean, yeah, he'd be booking. Absolutely. And it wasn't really a full year. It'd be fall. You'd get those September calls, and it's like, we're not going to squeeze you in. I mean, it's real, realistic. Like, take take life on. Now with a chance. Yeah, this is not going to happen. We can get you next spring, though. Mm -hmm. And then that would just start to pile up. And all of a sudden, you'd have half the next summer booked out in September. Before it's even the frost is gone. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's one of those things like it, it, yeah, we would love to spread that out. But yeah, reality. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that's a symptom of an, a non-standardized industry, not enough people to do the work, not enough professionalized company to to do that, you know, and it's, yeah, it's all tough. And and a single person painter, you know, who has, you know, 12 houses to do this summer, you know, gets an ankle injury, takes a family vacation, that's 12 clients who oh. were on the books that now have to go find another painter in August. Good luck. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's the service in the that's the thing. There are a big professionalized company where you can get an estimate within a week and get your house painted within one to three weeks. Yeah. That's a different type. It may not be better for all, but that is also a very valuable service. You know, um, let's see. Hammer Temple, both of you came from paint families and had fathers who were painters. How much did that help you learn and what to do and what not to do? So <laughs> taught me everything not to do. I respect my old man, but I came from a, a, a much different sort of experience than you did, which was I, I got angry at my dad on a lot of jobs. I walked off jobs with my father because we can't do this. This is BS. Like yeah. I'm not I'm not putting my name on this sort of thing, you know. So just like the army for me, a lot of negative reinforcement about, OK, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, you know, some things we're not going to do and that. I had to go. I've 
we say we walked off job. My dad wants to drop me off on a on a on ramp because we got into an argument on the way to the shop. So, so it wasn't so always for you. <laughs> when you're when you're down here, Mr. Hall, we're yeah. going to talk about oh, a couple yeah. beers. We're going to talk about that one. I love that stuff. Yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't even about pain. We, we, I used to always give him crap as a high schooler because this you know my this is completely sideline, but still about parenting uh, or being growing up, growing up in that, that kind of trades as a social worker all through high school. My dad and we had. We had a good relationship, but I always put up a fence because he was a social worker. That's what high schoolers are supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. And he would come home and he'd be, you know, if I had a crappy day or had something going on or I was being a little, uh, you know, jerk yeah. <laughs> per se, uh, he would come down and he just, he, and I count it as a blessing now to, to have him do these things. But I used to always tell him, I was like, don't use your social worker eyes on me. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> and, thought he was doing the Yeah, he's like, sure yeah exactly. And it's like, no, 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 no. Put this. <laughs> and I told him that one day on the probably 25 years old and you're driving to a job and he's going, I was just in a bad mood, pick me up from work. We're going to this job that was fitting a nightmare. I hated everything about it. And we were doing all these weird things and we weren't going to make any money, yeah. any good, good money on it. And, uh, and we were having this argument and he's looking, he's like, oh, this really don't look funny today. And I'm like, don't you, don't you. So he, was, he had had it with the conversation. He's like, all right, you can walk or you can call someone, come pick you up. I'm pulling, drop me off. You don't want to go do this job. Here you go. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> the middle of February, I'm not going <laughs> to, so that was, and we still joke about it to this day, but um, I did learn a lot from my dad I mean, and good and but we came different types of industries. I mean, my dad was social worker first, painter second, yeah. and that retirement job. And that was, as I said, take a negative thing from what I've learned. And he even, he'll say the same thing. He goes, I started this when I came to work with him. He wasn't doing this full bore. He wasn't, he didn't have to paint. He was, yeah, he had a pension yeah, yeah. and the other thing. So I, we always thought he was his retirement job. It was all bonus. Yeah, my brother still gives me crap about. He's like, you and dad, your little retirement gig, early oh, retirement. That's hilarious. It's like because there'd be weekends where like we'd finish a, what we thought was a week long job. Yeah, and then we'd be done on a Wednesday, and then be like, oh, oh you want to go fishing? Yeah, <laughs> and that's, and I'm out there with my 65 year old dad. Couple retired, so to be just like killing it out there. And finally like, building a family. Yeah, life and stuff. Like, yeah. this is when I was single. You know, I had a, a roommate for. You. You know, doing a oh, that's, on my face. that's awesome though. Yeah, but we made it work. It was a different yeah. lifestyle. But then uh, as you know, get older in life, it's like yeah, maybe I should start making a savings account. Maybe I have a you know life health insurance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So that changed, but that was probably the only thing he admits to. He goes, that kind of created you into this like we're just sloughing along, but there's times where it was like, an easy pace, right? Yeah, it wasn't something like I was doing the last six yeah. years where I was more so he was doing his little side jobs and I was going doing cabinetry. He never did cabinetry. He never sprayed. Mm -hmm. He bought us a great go 490. And <laughs> I remember him calling. I showed up the job. I finished one up, came up to him. We were painting this uh, apartment. He's like, hey, I bought a, bought a sprayer from Sherman. This is going to be awesome. Like we're going to spray this apartment, like get everything done. One color, walls and ceilings, trims, all going to be one color. And it got there. He's got, it's just splattering all over the walls. He's going, this goddamn thing. <laughs> what's wrong with technology? And I was like, this isn't really technology. It's been around for like, it's got a smart control on it. Yeah. That's about the only piece of technology yeah. on it. Otherwise, it's just a pump. Oh, and, and I remember going back and forth with him talking about it. And he's like, God, taking it back. And I was like, no, just call him that. Like, we'll get it figured yeah. out. And neither of us ever ran a sprayer, ever. Yeah. Like, we didn't know that if you stick it into a gallon of paint, it would pump all half, three quarters of a gallon into the lines and then not have enough paint over the top of the, of the rock catcher yeah. and would start, you know, priming again. or yeah. just, you know, throat or pumping. And he's like, God, Hell is wrong with this? Like you dump more in there, pump it out, and then get to that same point. I was like, oh, you need to keep a certain amount of you know paint yeah. over this enough pressure in there to feed into the system. And these little things we figured out, but he he swore off sprayers. He still to this day hates them. Like he won't. <laughs> I, I got him using a great go hand sprayer once to do doors and yeah. little touch up things outside. And he still he's like, I can't cut this damn thing. Like, this <laughs> well, I mean, as far as I know, my father doesn't own a computer or a cell phone, so yeah. not not quite dissimilar, but uh, you know. Yeah, uh, but see. but so yeah, those yeah. upbringings, good and bad. And I shouldn't say it was all negative for me. I mean, obviously, I was taught to paint. Yeah, and that's that's a know? big thing, and that's where my ours was just <laughs> throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what worked. Yeah. You know, test and fail. And there's a lot of times where it's like we tried different products. My dad was not taught a lot too. Where it's, we didn't just use Sherman. We try some Ace products. We try some stuff from the lumber yard. We try some the specialty stuff. paints, yeah. and and, yeah. and you find out. And especially now, coming up here and seeing like we use one product. And like sticking to that one thing instead mm -hmm. of offering these tiered systems for estimating, yep. going, hey, here's your price for using from our 200. Here's your price for that. Super that has been so people often think that's a value adder for the client. And I don't know that it is. Like mm -hmm. when I'm looking at tires for cars, honestly, it's like I've never had a bad one. 
No. Unless you're getting something sexy for an old car or mud tires for a truck where you want the the super swampers or something. Mm-hmm. Honestly, now it's like cares. Yeah, same. Like I under I've never had a bad experience. They all seem I something I don't want to spend money on. I've never been able to accurately help a client make a informed decision about different qualities of paint. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we just say we're the pros. Why don't we just use the best? Like to me, that's just like, why wouldn't you just do that? You're taking a variable out because clients honestly don't care that much about paint. We have all these irrational discussions about, you know, my neighbor used Sherman Williams and it sucked. So you can't use it on my house. And we're like, well, all right, well, built the business off of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> arguably I spent $300,000 a year on Sherman and it's great products, you yeah. know? So, and, but you have those irrational discussions where you're just like, what do you do with that? Yeah. You know? And so you need to be the pro and you basically just need to say, that's why we're not like, yeah, we'll just use the best. Who cares? Moving on. Yep. And this, and that we've ran that same thing. You try cheaper things, you try all these things. And once again, it, it's inconsistencies. One yeah. thing goes on easier than the other ones. When you use the same product, especially when you have eight, you know, or not eight, 10, 20 some painters or 16 yeah. to 20 painters. If you're throwing them different paints, I mean, super paint goes on different than duration. Yeah. From our 200 goes on different than from our 400. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, we want our people to, to focus on clean job site, being there on time, clean uniform, cordial with the client, yeah. taking care of them. We don't have to worry about, Oh my God, now it's this, yeah, now it's this. I've never things. tried it before. You know? And it's like, no, that's not the interactions we want to have. We know these things work. They're premium. So just go out there and do it. Yeah. Standardized product. So it's, it's yeah. different when you're one-on-one. I mean, I, I did many nights in my shop two or three in the morning, spraying different, trying different cabinet doors or yep. paints. Once again, because there's not these standardized things. So you have to make your own tests and tune type like exactly. decisions on it. But once I found something, when I was using like we, like what we have now, you standardize and then it's like, oh, awesome. All these problems I was having while I was trying to figure these out, yep. they're gone. I mean, people people think that standardized means factory. Yeah, We blow our clients' minds most of the time with the simple processes yeah. we do because I mean, again, it's that zero to a hundred scale. You and I can do a 98, nearly perfect. Nobody's perfect. Um, Our people probably do an 88. Mm -hmm. Client expects a 78. If we can do an 88 every time, we've already exceeded the expectations. Now, how much we want to get to the point where if we can add some value in an easy way, we will. But other than that, one of the biggest things that we deal with is when are you going to start? When are you going to be done? Mm -hmm. And if we want to do seven coats of primer on a cabinet door to get them better, we've just taken a five day process and turned it into a 31 day process. Yep. So sooner or later, the value you provide with that seven coats of primer is not as good as getting out of their house and yeah. giving them their kitchen back. <laughs> oh yeah. I've, and I've been there. You know? I had <laughs> testing primers before it might turn around on cabinets sometimes for two weeks and they, and the agitation by the end, it's like, just get, just give me my doors back. I don't, even, I don't care if they're, Covered in mud. Yeah, just, just we, like, we want we want our our life back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired of seeing you. Yeah. So any any yes. maybe maybe um, pick one more and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day here. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Derek Anselm has said, "Did you say is responding to uh, the fifty percent get accepted thing?" He said, fifty percent kill close ratio is what I hear as average among profitable companies. If you win every bid, you're not charging up. Kind of. That's true. true. Right now. So we track our weekly sales numbers, right? And I take, I take legacy clients, builders, some very weird jobs. I take the stuff that's like a little bit non-standard, but still in our wheelhouse, odd requests, some virtual estimates and things like that. And you're kind of doing the bread and butter out there. We track our SR. If you and I want to get a hundred percent SR next week, what do we do? Cheap and who wants a hundred dollar bedroom? Yeah. And then, who wants a $2,500 house repaint? <laughs> you know, it's like, and then even that, I mean, but then if you had the, add another variable that if you say, yeah, we'll do it for $2,500, but we're not going to do it until next year. I bet you'd still want to I mean, that, I think that there's would be another variable. That, that's, yep. I feel like that's starting to outweigh, I mean, pricing at this point. I mean, this time of the year in Minnesota, but yeah, the data plus the feelings is we, so this is a, this season in painting, especially in the upper Midwest, it gets to be April, it gets to be May. And painters, I hear are finally, finally, the long, dark winter is over. I can get some work. I can start making money. 
a professionalized business has work all year round and spring is almost a nightmare for us because we're getting 10 requests for estimates a day. We can't do 10 a day. No. And now people are like, what? You mean you got to wait two weeks to get an estimate? It's like, yeah, between you, <laughs> between right now and that estimate, I'm sorry, but we are going to do 80 estimates. Yeah. There's 80 other people who have been waiting two weeks. It's like, we don't want this either. Yeah. <laughs> we want to get to you today. Yeah, I'd love to do 10. But the demand days. is just like, and we're just trying to help people. We yeah. could tell people to go away. We want to help. Yeah. You know, that's, that's another part. And it's like a, a division that I estimate too. It's like learning. I'm sure other estimators or other company or owner operators run this too. It's like picking your battles almost and like choosing things that you can get a win on. And yeah. Like, not, and that sounds bad. It's choosing things you get a win on. But, but like choosing things where you can provide the most value. Because you can't fix everything. With now, if, <laughs> if a client says, we want you to come in and fix this decorative finish in a 30 foot foyer. We're like, not the, not for us. this is only tears at the end of this. <laughs> like we know that can't be done. Yeah. And if it can be done, 110 hours to come up with the paint formula. And then if the shine is, it, but we know that one of those things, it's not that we don't want to help. It's that there's a very low likelihood that we're going to make you happy at the end of this. I know yeah. what you want, but we just have to pick our battles yeah. and it's not factory work. It's things where it's like our people perform very well. I want our people to win. Yeah. That is a good feeling. Happy client yeah. under budget, your boss, the estimator, the whole production team is praising you. That's a way better way to go through yeah. life than we sent you on this decorative uh, project. We only gave you a budget of four hours. Uh, you're there for 110. The client still doesn't like it. Yeah. You've waited. It, no, nobody's happy then. No, not a, not a bit. And it's, it's learn how to say no, right? Yeah, it's ceiling touch ups. That's the, you could just uh, pit my that right there. That's like, another one yeah. too. Yep. I, I could, you and I, right yeah. now, with a set of artist brushes and some skill, we could probably touch up decorative wall painting way easier than touching up ceilings, right? Oh, yes. Touching, I've never seen one ceiling, yeah. unless you got lucky. No, yeah, just a crappy roll of dice on it. I've, um, I've told people, I said, there was one time when I'm estimating, because people are like, oh, there's paint on the ceiling here in the spot, you know, last painter, or, or we did it, and I have to can you fix that? Now we're helping the whole ceiling. And, that's, and it sucks because a lot of these houses where that happens, yeah. Are a great a great room where it's the ceiling runs through each touches each every room. single time and and so this is something where I I always joke with the clients and a sensitive joke mm -hmm. which is you never get a water stain in the front entry closet no, exactly. where you can just shut it and yeah. never look at it or stack shoe boxes you get it in the one that legitimately it wraps through the entryway in the yeah. parlor and the whole main floor and there's that one little it's like yeah. it always happens on that ceiling and I had one we had me around a job and I was like I can do this so how many whites can there be. I have eight cans of white paint, primer, hand mixed stuff with an artist brush. I did acrylic enamels, like an artist set, doing mixing things and touching up. And by the time I was done with it, I could have painted the whole ceiling. Yeah. And now I'm at this point where it's like, I'm still painting the whole ceiling, but I've also wasted an entire day. The difference is, and something we talk about is now you own it. Yeah, exactly. That's Now, you now you've created a situation <laughs> where they might've been better off before that. And now they're, they're probably looking at you like, well, well, you got to paint it now. <laughs> you got to make whatever you did go away, and that's so. That's that's not a relationship we want to have no, with clients, you know. So no. awesome. That's, Any other interesting ones on there for I you? No, the last we've kind of just been going right down the list. Um, uh, Hammer Temple the shows just made me change so much in my company. That's that's good to hear too. Uh, made, it, made us change a lot of what we do too. So the yeah, Instagram good anything or you got? Oh, I can scroll. I can no, it. that's okay. I got it. Okay. So we should is. So the last thing I want to ask is mm -hmm. like, when you came here, what was the most surprising thing taking a deep inside look into what we do? Um, just, I mean, standardization. I mean, just the fact that we, I came in here because I've done a lot of different jobs. Like I said, I mean, not a lot. Sounds like, <laughs> it's not like a crazy gypsy, um, but there's certain things we get into it. And it's like, you can tell me how good your company is until you set foot into it and then see how it's processed, like how the things go. And the air tightness of all the steps. I mean, yes, estimating like you, when you talk to me, I was like, oh, this is great. This is a pretty simple system. I feel like I could teach this to somebody. We too. should talk about that right after this. Too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, doing, doing this and then also we move and I see, you know, get my hands into the production manager part, being here for the meetings and seeing how Justin Holly handles stuff. And those two are like, just a fine, like a, a the most beautiful singer sewing machine, just like cranking along, yep. knocking stuff out. And, the exhaust of oh, a Ferrari. Yeah, and, it's, and it, yeah, and I've, I've literally, I've been doing this for how many years? And there's certain things where it's like, oh, these two have like give, put this little insight onto things, and it's like I'm I'm learning a lot from those two, and they've never painted really. I mean, Holly's had done some things, and they both got their hands dirty now being this company, 
but then moving on to uh, not moving on to the painters too and getting to my hands like being on the restoration out yeah. there and seeing how just even bringing in brand new fresh faced people and putting them on a job and it's like they're not terrified like if I was coming in sometimes like especially Roberts like Levi yeah. and, and Aaron and the big and, green restoration yeah, yeah and like just there's just this this system that like my dad always said, you know, never paint without a uh, you know drop cloth, even if it's just like a touch up. Yeah, it's like jumping on a plane without a parachute. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're you know you're you're gonna something's gonna happen. If the one little spot that you don't you're have tempting a fate. Yep. <laughs> and there's just so many little standardizations that are just and once again it sounds bad to say like standard, but it it is it just has this like feel of like you can't you can you could have stuff go wrong, but there's enough people in this company to either help you. Like yeah. our Slack Slack Messenger is just something that like yeah. You can build courses off of probably just looking through our, our messages. Somebody had a sprayer issue the other yeah. day. And, and, you can, you can and within five minutes, bam, 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 messages from all of yeah. you even chime in yeah. on a lot of That's those. Like, right. Hey, try this filler, or try, you know, and it's like it it is like I mean, you could you could charge access Yo, to okay. our our Slack yeah, thing for the question stuff. and answer stuff. Our our painters are legitimately so thoughtful. Yeah, and the fact that they're none of them, it's not a there's none of them that are like I'm the best. I'm, there's none of this like. There's humility, the and there's there's a lot of yeah. humbleness and yeah. a lot of open mindedness with that stuff. So and being in the trades before, like I said, doing the pipe thing, it's like if you ask a question and you see it on the paint contractor forums and stuff too. You, like somebody asks a simple question, they just started saying it's like, oh, how dare you? You shouldn't be touching a brush, and you shouldn't be painting for anybody because you can't do this simple thing. It's like, how did you learn? You didn't come out of your mom's womb. Yeah. With a paintbrush in your hand, you learned from somebody put else. up with you yeah. a long yeah. time. Exactly. Now you're mad. A lot of it. Not to stereotype, but it's older generation type yeah. painting where it's like. Well, what, what the interesting is, somebody somebody who did not come from the industry looked into all that stuff, and it says there's a lot of angry people yeah. that are painters. Like there's this anger, this deep seated resentment, probably because of that whole risk reward profile, where people legitimately are giving up their bodies sometimes, oh, yeah. and they don't really have a lot to show for it. Of course, you would be resentment at the when you're 58. And you've devoted yeah. 30 years of your life to this. And show honestly, if your if your ankle blew up, yeah. Whew, yeah. Dust in the wind. I had a guy that I used to come into uh the running store down in Austin and I'd get some you know different products sometimes from it. Uh just random weird things or tools. And there's like used to be a guy that worked in front of the, the checkout counter. And he, he was he goes, Oh, I used to be a painter. He goes, You, you gotta get out of this kid. You gotta you gotta get out of this killed me. I've got so much Thanks. my life is dead. And my life, like, this is why I'm here working at a counter. That's like, and he would tell me that just about every day. I don't know if it's a memory problem or, you know, that's probably part of it, but he's just like, this, this will kill you. You don't, you need to get out of this field. It's, it's nothing. It's not good for you. It's going to kill you in the end. It's going to make your body decrepit. And that's like, it's like every day I'd walk out there and I'm like, God, I just, and I just started avoiding the hell out of this guy. And then he vanished. Yeah, but it's, but, but it's interesting yeah, because and, what, what's fine about that is like, there's every stockbrokers will have that too. Oh, it's a, it's a man eat man right. world. Yeah. They chew you up and spit you out. My financial advisor seems to have a great family life, a respectable person in the community. There's not enough other loudmouth examples of success, yeah. freedom, happiness, well-being there to then say, oh, that's crazy Jim. Yeah, exactly. Oh, he's, <laughs> no, he's homeless, but he said that about every job he's ever had, yeah. you know? He's 28 but, saying that. But, that's, <laughs> but no other painters talk to each other. So crazy Jim's your only experience. You're like, well, that's one data good. point, <laughs> that's 100% of the data that I'm going to intake, you know? Yeah. And you know, like, you can't argue with them. You are shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You, and it's, I get that it's not an easy job always. I mean, yeah. my, my dad beat it in my head, wear, wear knee pads when you're crawling on the floor. Never, never did it. Guess what happens when I stand up now? It sounds like I'm breaking, stabbing, stabbing branches sometimes. That's all, during during our formal safety training in the company, I'm like, you can throw your respirators away. Yeah. If you if you have to pick knee pads or respirator, I would pick knee pads the rest of my life because Crazy Jim got out of this industry because of his knees. Yep. He didn't get out of it because of his lungs. No, you know that's not the. I've never yeah. seen somebody have so much interior respiratory damage that they have to leave the industry. Every single craftsperson beats their body up because they're not smart. They're not stretching. They're not eating well. They're not having an active lifestyle. They're not using knee pads and just yeah. simple things like that. I am fine. Yeah. 29 years, I feel the best I've ever been. People in this company know that even on that Robert's restoration, I get out of my van, I put my knee pads on, and then they're just on all day. Yep, it's because that. of that. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things that's not sexy. It's not cool looking, but 
if you just this one thing that it's like i avoided it i'm a perfect yeah. example don't do that now i have and i, I would beat my knees up snowboarding and skating and stuff yeah. i suppose too might be part of that well, so we all do those yeah like but jumping those, out of planes and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. you're not doing yeah. yourself any favors no, yeah. so there's just little things and but yeah coming to this company like the biggest thing was just seeing how it wasn't just one thing you've had you've polished up it's like you said you when you turn yourself and you train a parent that's mastering your sharpness sword train justin how i do the ordering and yep. the production manager stuff sharpness sword then teaching me and I was definitely afraid, like, okay, this has been great getting in. Now I've got to go right along with you and do these estimates. I got tongue tied beyond belief because you're standing next to me and it's like, oh, God, I'm not trying to pat your back or anything, but it's just like, I've got this person who's been doing this at a high level, is great at painting, but also running a business that is like what I would dream of if, for my company back then. And it's like, I think I told you even that email, it's like, I really enjoyed what I was doing at painting, but I feel like I'm better as a, in a team that I am by myself. And uh, to honestly, make that realization that, that's one of the <laughs> truest statements ever. I am better in a team. Yeah. It's, legitimately. Cause everything outside of that is grit. Yeah. And that's, it can only do that so far. Like it only takes you to this certain point yeah. and then you're, you're so, just bashing against the ceiling. You know? Core values and grit. Most of our industry can grit through to a certain stage. They can get out there, grab some humans, some warm bodies, do some work, probably won't light on fire. The second you start to professionalize, the second you truly hire an employee, it exposes all the unprofessionalism, you know, and all the things. If you don't have a job description, an employee manual, a set of deliverables, a review process, mm -hmm. a training process, a safety manual, our in, that makes me nervous and scared as hell for our entire industry that some people are employing 10 or 20 people don't have any of those. Yeah, and that's, how does it, I mean, now doing it, how does that work? Yeah. And I think that's how it does it. Helping <laughs> back the biggest, when I was at one point, like something I had started stepping further away from the company, I brought in people and I tried, you know, here and there, and it's like, I'll try and I'll, I'll set aside $500 cash for yeah. a big job and see how this goes. And I was just self-conscious because I, I, once again, I didn't send any of that things up. It's like, I, I you get to that point where like, I need someone here for this job. What can I do to get them in? And I feel like that's how probably a lot of these paint companies run. It's like, I need it now. And then all of a sudden we just kind of keep like, oh, we'll get this figured out. We'll get this figured out. We'll get this figured out. And then yep. all of a sudden it's 10 years later and you've got five of those people running around yep. in your company that don't really know. And and the biggest problem is, I mean, it, you, you're, the unprofessionalism gets exposed with one penultimate conversation, which always happens, which is I've been here a little while. I'd like a dollar an hour raise. Mm -hmm. And that's a feeling. Yeah. And fine. then the business owner is like, I don't know, feels to me like you were late a couple of times and I'm not drowning in money. So no. And that's a feelings based argument. But okay, yeah. if they had a job description they signed off of that says you're going to produce $55 of revenue an hour, here's a pay scale for the next five years. Yeah. And then you track their progress with job costing. You can see where it all then, you can have a database yeah. argument where he says, I feel like I want to raise. It's like, good, we have standards in this company. There's five things you need to do in order to keep your job and get a raise. Do those and here, here it is. Let's let's figure them out together. You yeah, know, and, then, and if you and if you don't have any of that stuff, no wonder people leave. Yeah, and you can't keep that. that and that's if you look at I don't know how a union pay anything, but when unionized like pipe painting thing, it's like you signed up for things and that they gave you that pay scale. It's like you were an apprentice. You See, that's this. that is a professional. So people bash unions. I I mean, listen, the, the ethos may, maybe here and there it may not align with what we do, but world class safety yeah. benefits. Job pays a little higher job description. There is no, I mean, there's arguments that somebody can snake around inside there and hide and whatever else, but also there's surety. Yeah. And that's something the rest of our trade doesn't. So I love the unions for that. It's like they are professionalized organization, Yeah. you know, and, and if we take the good things from that, get rid of the bad things, that's what the rest of this stuff needs. Yeah. Accountability was a huge thing too. I mean, coming in and like, cause even between leadership and painters, we all have that accountability thing where it's like we have if first all comes goes all the way back to the job description here's what i need to do to be yeah. successful in my job mm -hmm. here's what i need the people that i'm working with to do to be part of theirs and it's like you don't have to have it cuts out a lot of awkward conversations stupid yeah. things it's like we, no one likes to have those conversations but if you can just say here you know this is what you signed up for yeah you're doing all of it but this thing so work on that and, and we'll train you yeah and and the the difference in with a mature professionalized company who actually cares about what they're doing they're going to look at the standards we put out. And if somebody doesn't hit 55, we don't look at that as a way to fire them. No. We look at it like, let's coach them up. Yeah, it's just a way to identify training. Yeah. Your numbers we track. Yeah, and that's There's certain things that come up and we're like, okay, friction point observed. What do we do to do that? It's not like, I can't wait to fire Andy. The, yeah. This thing didn't happen. You know, it's like, no, that's it's a way for us to fix these processes. 
And you've seen it over the last six months. We've taken it from, there's some big friction points and we're like, solve it. Ideas, identify, discuss, solve. Now all of a sudden we're getting to such minutia. It's almost not, you almost can't tell it's a friction point in the company. But constant improvement. We'll trick our own small. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, no, we get to yeah. step over that or move around. Um, and it's the same with, thing. with any process, which is much with as much human interaction and as business that we do and touch, that we only deal with the small little things we do is amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that surprised wow. me to me because I had all these fears of hiring and then seeing how great these parents run and, and, and work together yeah. as a team and then. And then dealing with Justin Holly and dealing with us and, and you and stuff like they just it feels it feels good and, and everyone seems to be passionate about it too. I mean they're not all of them are as not all the painters are like this is my I get up and study you know bust out a book on painting mm-hmm. coding science or anything. No, yeah. but they like what they're doing. I feel like and I feel like they enjoy the process. They enjoy making something and making clients happy too, which is nice. It's a freedom machine. There's yeah. there's other things. So I want this to be here for the people who think molecular structure of oil primer is cool. That's there too. But I also want it to be cool for people who like, I want to break myself for four days and have 50% more time yeah. off than anybody <laughs> else, you know, was... and have benefits, health insurance, retirement. I want to work for a non boss. Yeah. I want to do, I, I want to be my own person. I want to do this fun set. You know, there's so many more things besides pay and benefits and love of the craft that are there in this thing. And if you, if somebody doesn't take an interest in molecular science, that's not a hit towards them. We're all yeah. here for different things. You know, we can all win together. Yeah. That's, that's been the, just a awesome takeaway from all of it. And then like, I don't know, it's just, like I said, it's something, there's something special about having, when you see a group like this, that's working together. And yeah, there's, we have the bad days too. There's times where stuff goes south, but we always seem to like tighten yeah. up like, okay, this, this happened. Let's talk about it. Let's like the IDS again. And Great that sounds really it's nothing you and I haven't ever no. experienced. It's no. like, Oh no, I've been, I've been at the deepest, darkest despair moments back when I was a single person painter where somebody basically just said, I don't like you. Yeah. I don't okay, like your do. work. <laughs> this is all BS. I have no other data back then to, mm-hmm. cause it was all me. And now it's like, Oh no, we, we do so much of this stuff. We have actually identified a certain percentage of people who will react a certain way. And now we know it's just when we react with, when we deal with a certain type of human, there is a pretty patterned response yeah. to it. And it's so low that it's almost stati- statistically insignificant, but it's still, it's we there. still encounter it and we still have to deal with it. So yeah. that we don't deal like none of this stuff bothers me. I'm actually very proud of what we've built and the processes and the rates of callbacks and the things like that, only because I get inside looks into every other paint business in the United States. And I click my heels when I see what we've done here, because we've, it's not that what we're doing is different and better. It's just that we have, we have gridded through that phase where we've crossed the professionalization hump. And I see the promised land on this side of what it's like to run a real business. And there is so little friction in what we do, you know, Oh, and that's, yeah, and if you can scale that, continue to scale it, that's yeah. just, yeah, like I said, the promised land. And I, yeah, that's it. So the last thing we'll talk about mm-hmm. too, and, and then we should probably get back to family time. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that honestly I'm proudest about in, in what you and I have built is you forced me to create one of the most easily digestible estimating systems yeah. in the country. Like, oh. uh, and, and, and when, when I say I created a children's book, it's not, like, <laughs> but legitimately you and I created it together. Yeah, so yeah, well, when, when I, the experiment was I could make a 300 line spreadsheet where you measure every inch of the house. We get a 3d model. You do this. It's not quick. It's not easy. It's not fast. It's, it, it doesn't really serve the client all that well. And I don't know that there would be a reciprocal like value to the company because then what production rate do you punch into that sheet? It's all over the place. So when we're basically experience, both of our experience and market rate based company, we just need to say, we need to get a lot of estimates out there. We need to constantly test what the market will bear Mm -hmm. and then provide the best value for the clients. I created a picture book. Yeah. Oh, and it's as doing it for 10 some years, there's some days where I like, (laughs) even since October, there's been times I pull up, pull up that in our, our database. And it's like, I haven't really seen anything like this before. And then I can go back and then just the, the wealth of, we go back, we have an our database on all these past jobs. And it's like, what, what can we do? We can take a job that this much, you know, did you did two years ago. And obviously we raise a little bit of price because that's yep. as the years go, we got to do that. But also it gives us like perspective on things like, 
I think our my biggest friction with like one of the things that I call you most about is like here's something I used to do, but I want to make sure that we're as a company I can scale that to our. You're managers. slowly yeah. detoxing from yeah. previous yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, and I had I had to get over that too because even our exterior numbers, somebody could probably look at what we do and say you need to significantly raise your exterior mm -hmm. numbers. Right now, you and I are gathering enough data to make sure yeah, that that's that the case. Yeah, it. because we do market rate, we have to test this squishy, weird economic number. So honestly, one of the coolest experiments I've ever done with this picture book is the theory is simplicity, right? Yeah. Everything we do is like, I just love a simple process. We made a series of like five different types of houses <laughs> from a tiny little glue together rambler to a Victorian restoration. Each one of them, because we've used apps that create 3D models, we actually have a square footage assigned to each. So what's really cool is there's a square footage and a price that we've actually sold these for and made money on to each one of those. The theory is you got five pages. Point to the house that this is most <laughs> like. If it's a little bit bigger, you go this way. If it's a little smaller here, if it's got a modifier, but really you can get 90% close to a price, a data-driven approach yeah. by taking our children's book that yep. we made together and basically saying this one. Yep. And that's it. It's, you know? <laughs> it is. And it's, it's one of those things like I, I, when you brought me on, you, you knew that one of my deliverables is going to be another estimator. And it's like, oh God, it scared the hell out of me. It's still You're going to have to teach it to somebody yeah. else pretty soon. Yeah. And, <laughs> but with all this, not, I mean, database and all these little, you know, pamphlets and we are books and our, you know, just the reference guides that we have and we, you put together, like even we haven't like said that one, here's square footage. Here's the jobs that were this square footage, yeah. but weren't priced correctly. And yep. thinking, and all of a sudden we didn't we didn't produce on these ones. Here's ones where we're right in the middle ground. Here's ones on the high end. Yep. And you can find it. And then like I said, these modifiers like it's a deck, it's a service source, it's, it's Lego pieces. You yep. just snap them together and it's exactly. like, oh, okay, here we go. And then you have to put that little and I do it to you all the time. Like I said, that sniff test, it's like, okay, now I need the the extra experience thing. It's like and all it takes is you read through. That's like, where you sprinkle in that experience that you yeah. and I have, which are like, listen. This house has deceivingly simple landscape. Yeah, right. Like this is going to be a like I can see one crew one side of this house for. I mean that's the modifier that we look for using that experience. But we're not doing that for the whole house. No, we're doing it for. We're trying to make sure that there's a couple of those things. But that's I've made because that's still uncodified stuff that you yeah. and I use experience for in our price cheat sheet that master thing that I've never released to the public. There is the modifier. Landscape gets this much. Lift gets this much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trees get. We actually are starting to codify that. So when you have to teach somebody, yeah. and we're setting this all up for somebody who's never been in the trades before, again, too. So we always have to make sure that. Well, of course, that's tricky landscaping. They don't know that. Like <laughs> we have to codify it. So yeah. I, I did an experiment years ago with painters in my company. We had a rain day, so I brought them into the conference room. And I said, you know what? You guys have been asking about like estimating because that's a weird thing, right? Like I'm going to teach you how to estimate in like two hours right now. Mm -hmm. So I walked them through a progression of those five houses. You know, we start off with a simple thing, a bedroom. You guys all know what we charge for a bedroom. It's yeah. easy. That's a commodity. Then we go to a deck. Then we go to a front door, you know, Rambler, two-story, three-story yeah, Victorian restoration. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> By the time we got to the Victorian restoration, I laid out some guidelines. Like if you come into the company, you don't have to guess. I give you some guidelines. We all estimated unanim er, anonymously the same project. We compared notes and we all talked about, it. and we started taking these young people and saying, oh, really? You charge a thousand bucks for that? That would give you 11 hours to do that. Do you think you could do that? They're like, oh, hell no. <laughs> you know, so that you take that experience. By the time we walked through the progression to the Victorian restoration, they were within 5% of my actual price for that house. That's, that's great. That's, that's a pretty... But again, it's like they can turn out somebody who's never estimated two hours later, a $65,000 insanely complex Victorian restoration on site mm -hmm. for the client and be within 5%. Yeah, or, it just, yeah. or you can train them for years, a, a 700 line spreadsheet where they have to measure. It takes two weeks to do the estimate. They're probably going to be within five. It's because <laughs> for me, it doesn't matter because it, at some point price will always matter, but really it doesn't matter. We need to make sure that we our workforce is producing at a certain thing. So we focus all our time on training people, maximizing their effort like that. The price is fine. Like yeah. it, it, pro, profit is not made by what we charge. Profit is made by how we produce. And yeah. we spend all our time as a company focusing on the production of the painters. That's yeah. why. So and that's yeah. You always you've said that a lot. And I called you on some of these ones where we're we're just modeling this or making that little you know my my bid the baseline and it's like give me let's just like I said sprinkling it's like. 
adding salt to the steak, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit, yep. just like here, let's make this a little better. Just yeah. To fit, fit the, uh, the occasion, but it's, yeah, it's unbelievable on that department. Cause I, we, you know, like I said, my dad made those three different things, averaging them out. But even when we were doing exterior bids, it's hours. It was hours I'm looking around. We'd sometimes get, I'd get the extension ladder up. I'd be up on looking at the gable ends. I'd be checking stuff. And it's like it, the amount of time, like I said, that having those data points with square footage and having that our, our children's book, which <laughs> looks like people are requesting it on here too now. So <laughs> listen, I give I give everything away for free. Honestly, it's not because I'm a jerk. It's not going to help you. No, you got to know. Like I said, you got to know your production numbers. You got to know if, if you are a single person painter and you use my prices, you will not do yourself a favor. You need to producing twice as much as what we're producing per yeah. hour as a company because. Most of our company is made up of people who are super thoughtful, decent human beings. Many have been introduced to the trades through this company and they've yeah. been here for a few years and they're masters. The majority of this company is not, yeah. they're training. So the price that we charge to get our work will do harm to your company. So I, I'm just being honest there, you know? So uh, the people who run professionalized businesses, the conversations they have with me is, let's talk about how we actually create a system to come yeah. up with prices versus what do you charge for X? Because I I have found the worst data points ever uh, when I ask other painters <laughs> what they charge for what, yeah. and nothing passes the sniff test. I can't figure out how they come up with their stuff. When they do have a formula, they start with profit and they do, it's like, how do you even know you can guarantee production on? You're already starting to take into this and we mark up materials. And it's like, they're spending all their time on the stuff that doesn't matter when really like the biggest thing for me is a young painter will come and say, this luxury home builder is coming to me and they want me to do all their homes. What do I charge? I want to get my foot in the door. And I just want to say, it doesn't matter. They have a price already. Yeah. And if you bend over to or not bend, but bend yourself to fit those, a lot of times you're going to be burnt. Uh, that builder knows exactly what they're going to charge that client for. And they're going to charge 5% of the cost of the house, $50,000 on a million bucks. And then they're going to try to find a sucker like you to do it for 15. <laughs> and that's where their margin comes from. And next year you're going to be going, and it's... then you're going to, that they're going to be screaming at you. You're going to have to repaint the house twice because of trade damage and do all that. Profession, commercial painting. There's already a price out there. Mm -hmm. Can you get to it? Can you be professional and produce it? home building there's already a price out there it it doesn't matter make your fancy formulas do yeah. your takeoffs doesn't give <laughs> no that's it's still and i, I you're just, <laughs> just we're the same boat i mean when we came on when i came on board and you know talked about new construction that's was one of my one of my things my tripping stones i would say that i was like i don't know man because i've never to this day even the 10 years that i was working with my dad I mean, we we started just avoiding it same with decks like decks it, it, not that you there's you you've got an awesome system decks but um, getting people to understand that Dex and Minnesota are a maintenance issue. They're not something you do when you get 10 years out of them. Yep. Um, new construction. It is hard to find if you're a company that's focused on quality and, and just like giving a customer this beautiful thing at the end, new construction, there is not a lot of contractors out there that are looking for that. They may, may tell you that they want this. Schedule price, schedule, yeah, price exactly. schedule price, schedule price, schedule price, schedule price. We, <laughs> we want you when we want you. We're not going to give you much heads up and we want you super cheap because that's our margin. Yep. And I want you to do it all before everyone else comes and puts things in it. So will fix the mistakes. <laughs> I've, I've done this super embarrassing thing of making these beautiful introduction packets, you know, portfolios of my work. And these people are just like, if you can't start Tuesday, <laughs> you're garbage to me. Don't ever talk. Flip to it me. over and start right on the back of it. You just like, <laughs> thank you for the scratch pad. So anyway, we yeah. got to get back to our families. Yes. Thank you everybody for watching. I do appreciate this. If you want to see, so I have a whole bunch of master's classes. We're taking all over the country. Um, I actually show you a lot of those price guides and things. I don't hand them out to people because again, they're not useful, but I, I show you about 70% more back end of how we came up with all that stuff, our theory and our processes of estimating in the estimating master's class. We get into all that deeply, um, data-driven approaches through job costing and industry benchmarks master's classes and if you guys want to be there there is a link in this show if you want to host one near you all you got to do is raise your hand somehow in the comments here in an email to me and we can get one going and uh, also i would ask you to look into the pca uh dear friend now dear leader jason paris has taken uh control of the board of directors of the pca and he is enacting some of the coolest things i have ever seen in the industry uh, I am there with him as a partner to, to see this vision through over the next bunch of years. So buckle up. It's going to be insanely exciting. 
and the needle will be moved. That's all I can tell you. So looking forward to in-person stuff again as well. So Andy, thanks for doing this. Oh, I do man. appreciate Anytime. this. Uh, it's so, fun. So yeah. And people, yeah. if you email Andy, he's not going to send you that price guy. <laughs> Leave Andy alone. He's got a family. It's Memorial Day weekend. You got to go through me. Yeah. So uh, anybody, have a good Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Thanks for all those who served. Thanks all who served who are not with us anymore. And uh, back to family time for both of us. So see you.